around the world or wherever you are. I like how the very first thing that people do on a stream when they're paying attention in, in the chat is they say where they are and, and their location and what time it is. Um, and it's kind of endearing to see that there are so many people here to join us to remember Titanic from around the world. And I know that some people are tuning in from ridiculously early or late places. Um, I just saw one from Turkey, and it's four in the morning, four in, the morning in Turkey, goodness gracious. So indeed, it's, 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 it's very, very, very early in some places. So let me turn down this a little bit, sorry. Uh, let me turn myself up. I'm still getting over a uh, COVID stint, my COVID 2.0, and my voice is not 100% recovered. But okay, so welcome everybody to the 110th anniversary live stream of the sinking of Titanic. And this is also the, it's weird to think about this, it's the sixth year anniversary of our real-time sinking, uh, which is what we kind of are remembering too. S six years ago, we made the sinking animation that became so popular, unbeknownst to us, overnight, practically. And uh, we're going to look back at that a little bit. But the Titanic does not hit the iceberg for about another hour. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, I've set my little, I've set my, I have an analog watch, uh, a wrist watch still, and it's a Timex, and <laughs> I've set it to Titanic time, Titanic time, where she is right now in Atlantic, um, 110 years ago, hundreds of miles from land with 2,208 2, passengers and crew. It's evening, it's 10 to 11 Titanic time, and we have about, oh, say, less than an hour until the iceberg is struck. So we're early, and we have some things to talk about first. We have some housekeeping things. I'm going to bring about our our guests. We have a couple of guests. Let me make the screen actually move. I have something to make the screen move. There we go. Enjoy the grand staircase for a bit. Um, the very first off the back, we're, we're going to just talk about um, the game a little bit first before we jump into the sinking, the real time sinking, because we have some time. Uh, we have some real time. And if you joined us earlier in the week for our f anniversary of the maiden voyage setting sail from Southampton, England, uh, thank you for coming back to join us again. And if you were there for that, you might remember we had a few giveaways, and we're going to have another giveaway again tonight before we get into the the real time sinking during the the more depressing and respectful time of the evening. But there's something I must ask, and we have to see, and I have to see, I have to look in the chat and check. Is Santi Rico here still? Is he here in the chat? Are they in the chat? Because you want to co there you are. You did, I haven't, there you are, literally right there, I'm asking for you. I haven't g received an email from you. Please email us. <laughs> I was looking for, everyone else has contacted me, but I haven't gotten a, you're literally on my little sticky note for Ask Santi Rico for a coaster. I haven't gotten an email from you. So Santi Rico, I'm going, I specifically, you were the very first thing on my to-do list when this live stream began. So don't worry. Um, Santi Rico. I, if that's how, if that's not how you pronounce your name, I apologize. My last name is Dewinklier. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a rough life, but yes. So anyway, um, that's the very first thing off my to-do list. So, so we are going to give out another, um, wonderful, I don't want to say prize because tonight is an evening that is not full of prizes, technically. Um, we're here to remember Titanic and the lives lost aboard her and those lives who were changed forever when they s survived the disaster. But we still want to remember Titanic in a way we're all researchers here. 
we're all here because we wish to explore Titanic. I just wanted to explore Titanic, and that's why I wanted to rebuild Titanic digitally. So we're going to give out a... I left the book somewhere else. But it is... I'll get to the... We'll get to the giveaway eventually. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, and I'll bring on Kyle Hudak in I'll, just a moment or so, is we're going to discuss the state of the alpha for Titanic Honor and Glory and the updates coming to Demo 401. And if you checked out our YouTube channel um, earlier today, which you're here right now, or our Facebook, you would have seen a wonderful update video with wonderful footage that Kyle recorded from all of his updates that he did in the engine and modeling the wonderful cruise spaces. I can't give any more praise to it. So, um, oh, but I have to check the chat because I see a lot of things flashing. And today I don't have to actually focus on holding a controller in my hand and moving around the ship so much. I'm happy about that. So, gosh, you guys, um, this is not why we're doing this, but thank you so much for all the super chats. Um, we're going to, I'm going to try to focus on questions, not just super chat questions. And um, I don't have the proper restream equipment going. Um, I want to say thank you to Midnight Gamer and Albidam, Albidam again, um, Brandon, or Brendan, uh, another Matt, uh, and Jackson. Uh, we're, uh, thank you guys so much. Um, there's a, I see there's a lot of questions popping up. There's, we'll focus on a lot of these questions as they happen in real time when it's live 110 years later. So um, without further ado, though, I want to jump into what the main focus of this YouTube channel is about first and discuss that, which is the game Titanic Honor and Glory. And... Uh, Gilly Flower and Ray Purchase, thank you uh, very much for your contributions as well. And thank you all for being here again. Um, there's, you, you don't have to um, do anything like this. I remember also seeing one from Jake in the beginning, and if I missed one, I'm, I apologize so much. And, and John, thank you too. And thank you all for being here, you guys. This, is, this means so much to not just help us, but to remember Titanic. Um, but I want to bring in Kyle in one second as soon as I hit the unmute button on my desktop audio and we can begin talking about Titanic Honor and Glory the game itself before the night turns to history and remembering Titanic 110 years later so um, you guys thanks so much for all the support that you're giving right now in Super Chats and just your questions um, but we're going to talk a little bit about um, I, I just missed two other ones. Um, Jalen, thank you. And Arrow Games, thank you. Titanic has not hit the iceberg yet. That one I can answer really easily. That question I can't answer. We're not there yet. We have the time. Titanic time is 10.56, according to this watch. So Titanic, honor and glory. Kyle, I hope you're there. I hope I'm here too. Okay, let's let's see if everybody gets excited for hearing Kyle, and then I know that they can hear you. If you don't show excitement, I'll be disappointed. Yes. All right. Okay, Kyle. So, whoops. Oh, I lost my picture of Titanic. <laughs> Uh-oh, you don't want to do that. That's okay. I have another one. Okay, now we can talk. <laughs> All right. Now we can so, talk about the the state. We, well, so we have a lot to discuss discuss before Titanic hits the iceberg. And for everyone tuning in, Titanic hits the iceberg um, at 10.38 Eastern time. Um, and that's... In some time so again we wanted to start this stream early so we can discuss um, the status of the project Titanic honor and glory and we re rebooted rebranded Titanic honor and glory about last year this time and we one of the main things that we wanted to do 
was release an alpha. And basically, we've struggled to do that. Um, and Kyle, why don't you tell the, the folks at home what you just told me? Kyle knows how to sum this up much better than I do. Yeah, well, yeah, as you all know, we did uh, have our big change in direction uh, a year ago at, at this point. And we set out to make the THG Alpha, which uh, was to start with the uh, Folksel, uh, just the Folksel deck on the exterior. It's the, you know, of course, the deck at the front of the ship. And uh, re relatively simple space, uh, a little complicated exterior wise, but, you know, shouldn't take that long. But unfortunately, over the course of the last year, we, we had a fair few difficulties, uh, way more than we expected. And uh, you know, the short version is we had delay after delay until the point where our original goal of uh, releasing the alpha, the first release that is, by the end of the year, unfortunately that fell through. And uh, as a result of that final delay, we decided that you know, to make up for it, you, we would release Demo 401, which you all know by now, which at the time it was about 20-something percent of the ship. And... Uh, we were hoping that the alpha would still be forthcoming after you know after uh you know, early in 2022 yeah and early in 2022 and you know, unfortunately it didn't quite work out that way we ended up having a bit of a change in the team and uh, at the same time you know we, we were doing a little more work on Demo 401 uh, because it kind of turned into this thing that was bigger than we expected it to be. You know, we thought we would just release it and it'd be done. Every every yeah. time that we've tried to create Titanic, we've discovered Titanic is bigger than we've anticipated. So as we've as I've read in the chat, people say, you know, should Titanic be rebuilt? Uh, we're, we're trying to rebuild Titanic um, and just rebuilding the ship by herself let alone a sinking, let alone a story, let alone a, a Titanic world with passengers on it. It's 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 a it's an intense undertaking for the the small team, which is which was us to begin with, and then volunteers, and then a, a team of about a core team of twelve. You know, uh, sometimes I even forget that we're not a. I wish that we were a professional game design studio uh yeah but we're not unfortunately so it's still always a, a tough thing a tough monster of a world to create yeah as lovely as it's this just, looks <laughs> yeah it's such a complicated ship in in many ways and you know, unfortunately the process of creating it can also be uh, pretty complicated as many people and, yeah, know because there's many talented titanic artists out there who you know not just us you know who are creating 3d titanics and 2d titanics and um you know we're, we're not the only ones who um create titanics and uh it's 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 whoever decides to create a titanic you know be it for their own personal hobby or for a project such as this um you know they should be supported you know because it's they're doing it for the same purpose that I think we're doing it because we want to remember Titanic and bring her story back to life. But besides moving on from all that sentimental stuff that we all know about, let's continue and discuss where we've snowballed into a little bit more, I guess. Right, Kyle? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, we've had a, a bit of a snowball. So yeah, after the unfortunate um uh, happenings with the alpha and the change in the team we you know, we we, we kind of we you know we did we we did suffer a little bit of a setback and you know i, I guess we just kind of felt collectively a bit dejected i mean uh it's i know our fans have felt you know, these delays they aren't fun but they're no easier on the rest of the team and we needed a little bit of time, we figured, to collect ourselves, 
to do something that made us, I, I, I guess you could say, happy. Uh, something that filled us filled us with joy. And Demo 401, I suppose you could say, was that thing. And so, you know, even kind of before the the the, uh, the last sort of uh, setbacks with the alpha happened, I had started a little bit of work on kind of updating uh, Boiler Room 6. And after everything went down, I decided, you know what, I'm going to try to do a little bit more. You know, refreshing up the fireman's tunnel and a, a few other things in this area and make it nicer for the demo. And it kind of snowballed from there. And, you know, long story short, I basically made a sizable chunk of the areas in the bow. So, you uh, and, and these things aren't made to the quite the same standard as would be for the alpha Whoops. proper. So, they could, so hmm? I was going to show them this, but I made it, messed it up. <laughs> and... Yeah, so of course they were made. They were. It was possible to make them a lot faster than usual. Um, maybe it's time to you. Maybe we should share your screen, Kyle, and show them everything. Yeah, because I can only see a portion of the screen. Yeah. yeah, Kyle is going to. You know, guys, we're gonna. There's. We're gonna show you some. We saw this video, which I'm trying to show you on my end, uh, but it's cropped. Oh, you, you get that started, Kyle, and then I'll get it ready. You saw a portion of this crew update, which is Boiler Room 5, 6, the Fireman's Tunnel, the Spiral Stairs to the Fireman's Quarters, but Kyle's going to show you a little bit more of it, I hope. Not all. He's gonna, he likes to keep surprises, but he's going to show you a bit more, as we still have about tw oh, 30 minutes, 35 minutes until Titanic unfortunately collides with her destiny. So Kyle, if you want to pop your screen... And I will share it with the folks at home when you're ready. Right. Let's see. Whoops. Hopefully this is working. I hope this works too. Because I am sharing through Discord, and that's getting shared through here, so it's like a double stream. This is a double st stream, everybody. So go, go slowly, hopefully. Kyle. Go slowly. Oh, you want to go? Okay, I'll, I'll do one mile per hour. It this is the snail, as I call it. <laughs> it does look like a snail, doesn't it? And then everyone can see Ben right there. He's just hiding. He's just hiding, joining us. He hasn't said anything. But our 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 good friend, researcher, and super fan, voice actor Ben, is right there hiding in Discord too. So yes. Ben, let us know you're here. Right. <laughs> so. He's oh, right. So ben, Ben's in the in the in the UK. So it's like two in the morning. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm, my voice is going to be a bit like this, but hi guys, yeah, it's lovely to um, be on this stream as well, but I'm going to stay quiet for this bit. Okay, thanks Ben. All right, uh, all right, Kyle, take sorry. us on your snowball of a, of, of a demo four of one, of what I call the the snail of Titanic, because I think it looks like a snail. Sure. Anyway. Right, it's some kind of creature anyway. It's a creature. So these little bits, these little bits down here. You can't go into them. It's just, uh, it's just like a little bit of a. Yeah, you kind of go in here, and you can see down the row of boiler rooms. It's what a really mess! Cool. Who tipped that over? Yes, yeah, some some inconsiderate trimmer uh, dropped their wheelbarrow, and now you can't get into boiler rooms uh, four through one. So Jack, that's unfortunate. I hope it wasn't anyone named Jack Dawson or James Dawson. I apologize. Anyway, right, I gotta say, I gotta say, I think I missed these from Trainstorm and Dan Hain and J Pod. I'm so sorry if I missed anyone else, but thank you guys for these super chats and these questions. Um, if you guys want to ask questions when the sh about the sinking of Titanic, ask them when the sinking is actually occurring, please, um, and we'll ask <laughs> and we'll answer anything that we possibly can. Um, yeah. You know, um, as we're going around these models in Unreal Engine 4, um, it should just be kept in mind that everything you see here, um, it's not the final visuals. It could be changed down the line, etc. Um, right, Kyle? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yes. Th this is a uh, base. This is what's. This is the build on my end. Yep. But when it goes to Derek, you're gonna see the wonderful final graphics. 
that he'll be able to impart on it, yeah. and uh, including stuff like ray tracing. Derek, our, our lead programmer, who will make magic work. Um, if you're in our our Discord, or if you're um, if you join if you've joined our Patreon, you've seen some of his magic firsthand. Uh, you were able to speak with him. Um, pretty much like he's, he's there like he's there late at night my time like i saw him like i think last night changing the lighting in some rooms and everyone was kind of freaking out about it so yeah um, he's there editing yep. things in the engine all the time and showing them off yeah he's um he's a miracle work when it comes to the unreal engine redo it all in Eng Re unreal engine 5 that's an interesting idea but anyway it's uh i know we've been using i know ue5 came out recently but uh, at the moment this is in ue4 kyle you might like the super chat i might i might that's from linus mummy uh their their last name is also hudak um but they they said they did a great job well thank you yes so uh i'm gonna go ahead and take us on a little little tour here okay a little tour. Um, good because we have to i have to make sure to stop you at 11 32 titanic time uh-oh i better hurry up before you, hit the you have a while you so, got like so. 10 5 10 15 20 ish minutes but yeah oh cool well this boiler room doesn't uh flood until later anyway so we're good so <laughs> this is boiler room five and yeah this was not in the uh in the previous uh demo 401 at all we, right we were only new. in we were only in boiler room six this is so this is the one aft of boiler room six yeah. Okay. Because... And this this one I built I built virtually from scratch. I'm mean, using a lot of parts from Boiler Room Six, of course. Uh, but it is a very interesting boiler room. It's full size in the sense that it's got five boilers. So you get you you can look down the the row here, and it's it looks a big really room. cool. Uh, yeah. You know, one still cold. This is very messy. It's in use. Oh. The other, not so much. I don't it's think very you, clean. I don't think you can actually go through a. Uh one of those so. oh no that's not i, I cheated yes uh, this is this is how you would get through the boilers you go through here yeah and it's very fun all right a very a very tight space you you don't want to be here it's I, scary I, yeah i don't like tight spaces i'm tall so I, I i've realized in our construction of titanic that i would have panic attacks a lot especially down here so yeah yeah, and you know you have these access points. You you can take the catwalks on the tops of the boilers, on the gauge platforms, and up the uh, casings, like up here, and uh, down here as well. See, that's this is the if you pause right there, this is where it's just chaotic, where you can just look down and see the madness. Because I've watched so many sh engine room ship videos of. You know, like I've seen Liberty ships and uh, ships, you know, oil tankers, and I've looked down in their in their engine spaces, and that's that's what it looks like. Is just when you look down, you just see catwalks and pipes and everything like that. So that's it looks realistic to me, even though I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea what Titanic would look like. <laughs> yeah, and maybe we don't know a lot of these things for for certain, but yeah, I tried to make this as accurate as possible from the material I had and so there are improvements over even the previous version of uh, 401 and we'll head into oh, lost right we'll head into boiler room 6 here finally you can access the aft stokehold where you have the uh, <clears throat> ash ejectors and the uh, ash hoist now the ejectors they're pretty simple things. You dump ash. Yeah, you take the ash out the uh, bottom here. Because coal you burns know, and, and turns just... into ash. Yep. And you just dump it into the thing. You know, pull that. It uh, sends a jet of water up and it gets thrown out the side of the ship. But in port, you can't do that because they don't like when you pollute the water. So you would use the ash hoist and you'd haul it up through this tube. Uh... And the tube... The tube is kind of fun because it goes. It went right from the ceiling down through the boiler room, to the gauge platform. So the only time, and, the only time that they they cared about dumping things into the sea, into the ocean, was when they were actually in port. So. <laughs> yeah. And so you, you use this ash hoist 
to haul it up, and this is a very fun machine. I, I didn't even know that it was oriented at this angle until I saw uh, some plan for Olympics boiler room, and I thought, wow, that's weird. Oh. It makes sense, because they wouldn't be able to fit it otherwise. And this is, of course, an ash place. They would haul it up here, and then they just throw it out the door into a waiting, uh, uh, like a, uh, a barge. I and in this area, it's fun because I ask you. Can, I know you're excited, Kyle, but just as, as I am, I need to make sure I slow down my speaking. You need to slow down the camera just a little bit too, please. Oh, thank you. That's suggestions from the Discord. I appreciate it. <laughs> And yeah, this opens up into the uh, into a steward's laboratory. Ah, uh, yes, all the stewards for passengers, for the the saloons, for the dining saloons, they would have common quarters on E deck, and they would not. Of course, these these crew members would not have their own personal bathrooms. They would have to share uh, laboratories, um, and there'd be one. There's only like one or two bathrooms per steward sections. And you, if you were a superior steward, if you were a steward that was in charge of a certain area, you'd have your own uh, bathroom. Not private, of course, but that's a, this is a steward's laboratory for a group of stewards. I, I'm not, I forget off the top of my head which one it is. I wish I had my deck plans open, but yes. Now we go back Let's down see. the ash hoist. There's going to be a yeah. lot of going ups and down. Not of ash later on, but yes. So we're back in boiler room now, six. Now this, yep, and this is the uh, forward stoke hold. This was previously in the in demo four one already, mm -hmm. but there have been a few changes, especially to uh, let's see, we got some uh, a nice watertight door model so with these, all the details modeled out. These watertight doors are going to be very important. Now these are interesting because there are different ways to control it. You know, you could. Uh, you could uh, operate it from the bridge. It would send a signal to this box. It would kind of pull this little arm with the weight on it up, and it would do something. I honestly don't know the specifics. That would uh, trigger something in here, and the door would start to fall. Right. Right. Or if it if the if the area started flooding, there's a float down here. You know, it would uh, come up a little bit. It would trigger through this little uh, set of uh, arms and whatever. Uh, this this uh, thing and the door would fall or you could manually pull this lever and it would have the same effect so And if you wanted to open the door, yeah, you just use this crank So remember there. there's several methods for the door to be closed. It's almost like this room is practically Flood proof or practically unsinkable Practically yes, yeah. I mean like the technology that you had aboard Titanic not just to propel her, not this, not just to give energy and steam to the engines, but to keep her safe, like these watertight doors, is so sophisticated. There's there's several methods to keep the ship from flooding. That you can see why that's not just yeah. not just the builders, not just the advertisements, but even the captain of the ship would even say that the ship is unsinkable. So indeed. We can see how that has become such a part of her myth mythology. I'm sorry, I keep going. I enjoy. I'm enjoying this tour thoroughly. You um, you still have about. Uh, you, can, you can hurry up. Go to some cool places. All right. Uh, yeah. I'll have to do less talking. So here we go. Every, uh, we enjoyed the talking. But yeah. What is this? This looks like a rocket ship. Uh, it, it is a rocket, a uh, little-known fact about Titanic. Okay, now this is actually the uh, lower funnel. Uh, this is the, what's under the, the visible funnels that you see. And it kind of goes down. You know, the funnel would be up here. It goes down vertically. And then it kind of, oops, oops moving fast. But it attaches to these uh, little vent these little trunks, which are kind of spidery. And they attach then to the boilers. This is a view you don't usually get to see. I mean, in yeah. cutaways, yeah, but. So, well, we also have the cold bunkers. And uh, that wasn't a joke about the fire. It's, it's actually here. Yeah, that's why I kept uh, it at the I end decided... of that video. It's <laughs> I decided to. 
<laughs> I decided to add it to kind of demonstrate the general idea of a, about where the fire was and maybe kind of what a smoldering coal fire looks like. It's not a blazing inferno that caught half the ship on fire and uh, it's nowhere near, say, where that mark in that photo was. Like, it, it's just this, it was just in a little spot the bottom of the bunker, uh, but probably we, against the bulkhead. But we do have a little bit of a ding in the the coal bunker, don't we? Yeah, there's a. It was reported that there was a small uh, heat-induced ding in the in the uh, watertight bulkhead. You know, it was dinged uh, outward, I think, towards the forward side, and they uh, they rubbed some uh, oil on it. But I don't think that would have been enough to compromise the bulkhead. And the question the question is how did it catch catch fire i mean like the, you know things it it's a it's full of coal and there's air and it's hot and it's you know it's things things just go poof how did the hindenburg catch yeah. fire i don't know so yeah this is a, you just kind of have spontaneous combustion of these things sometimes sometimes what Akram, what, what i can't ever remember the the term Akram's razor the most obvious thing is usually the um Simplest explanation. Simplest is explanation, yeah. One. And it's just a common occurrence that happens on these ships. So here's an area which was it happened all the time. Is was has been explored on both not this not this lower area, but has been explored on Titanic and Britannic a little bit. Um, the fireman's staircase. So um, this is fascinating to see. Finally, in demo four hundred one, this space is just a blank box, more or less. Yeah, not anymore. This, but this it's is not a new. dead end. This is new. Um, this is fun uh, on on G deck here. Uh, we have a little. What's this? Oh, it's a cargo hold. Now this area is interesting because the the hold that you see uh, currently in four hundred one is a baggage hold. It's not a cargo hold. It's for first class so, baggage, right? First and second class baggage. It's designed to be accessible. Oh, oh yeah, excuse me. First and second class baggage. I forgot. Got to be technical, and so this area would be packed. Mm -hmm. This area would be packed with actually inaccessible cargo uh, for the voyage. And you know, this isn't really what it would look like laid out. It would probably be a little more tightly packed than this. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, um, I'm netted properly or what it, what have you. Sorry, but yeah, I guess. Oh yeah. Imagine and um, baggage handlers on an airplane. They pack that in nice and tight so that things don't roll or etc yeah yeah and you would also have you'd also have regular passenger baggage like in the sense of big trunks and stuff like that indeed uh, the stuff but, that doesn't need to be but that was not where the automobile was was kept no. the, the car this is this is hatch number one right here that you're seeing behind these iron bar iron bars that look like jail cell bars yeah. they're called spar and bars um but this is hatch one and the, and the the car went down hatch two i believe off the top of my head and right now we're right now we're in the uh fireman's quarters this is where all this you gotta you, I hope hopefully you're friends with your neighbor because you're pretty close to a lot of your buddies here so yeah very little uh, privacy we're not we're not 100 percent sure if these uh, dividing bulkheads were here, but you know, it, it, may, it would make sense. But even like, if... yeah, but on, on what we yeah. do here at Titanic Honor and Glory is when we don't have a picture of a space from Titanic, which we have very few of, we have them on, Olymp if we don't have something from Olympic, we use other ships. And for that space, we've seen those dividing bulkheads on Leviathan, I believe. And Leviathan was a ship built originally as Imperator. And we've seen the exact same bunks on another ship, and we put them on our ship. So this cargo hatch is interesting. Ooh, the top of the staircase. Oh yeah, the top. Well, the kind of the top kind of, of the, the spiral top, stairs. Top of the spiral stairs. Kind of yeah, kind of the top, and then you go up these stairs. Oh, what's in here? What is this? What oh, what could this be? I don't know. I've <gasps> never even been in here. We're under the forecastle. Oh, we're under the forecastle. So this is under the most forward deck of Titanic. So there's the top, there's the top of the, there's the top cover of the hatch right there, which, when the ships hit the bottom of the seabed, blew off, 
and landed some hundred yards, I'm not sure, in front of the ship, dinged the anchor crane, and is sitting there still. That's the underside of it. And there is a long ladder that goes, well, we don't think the ladder actually went all the way down. It seems like, according to wreck footage, which is very confusing, but still. Well, at least this piece wasn't up here. Right. Hard to say. So we have the uh, Siemens mess here. A few uh, doors are missing here, That's but okay. uh, it's a very it's a very simple space. I think there should be a dado here. I think there's a dado. A dado is when the wall is colored two tones. Yeah, I like what you have out here. This is a dado. A very fun space, though. And uh, the other side of the stairs, and you go down here. This would lead down to the third class open space. So you now have a loop. The fireman's tunnel is no longer a dead end. You we can, can exit round and, and round. Uh, yep, yeah, round and around the stairs, and then round and around the uh, the boiler through the boiler rooms. It's uh, pretty cool to be able to do that. Oh, but what's in here? It's this lovely little... when things connect. Wait, where's this go? Oh, oh my gosh, what is oh, that? Oh. Wow. Oh, what's this? There should be a, first of all, there should be a door here. I'll probably add one. There's always but, a door somewhere. Wow. Wow. Let's climb up. Someone really needs to go up this um, and look out for a bunch of icebergs in yeah, about better, 5, better 10, 15 up. minutes. So, yeah. Oh. Well, that's when the, you know, 15 minutes is when the... Oh, well, they oh, have... No, we don't have a foxhole. They have that's, a lot more to worry no about exterior. than icebergs. Oh, at least there's a bell. No. Oh, yeah. That, that, that's helpful. So I, definitely... I, I do not want to climb a mast. I must tell you that. Oh, it does look like a Jeffrey's tube. <laughs> a Jeffrey's tube. Oh, and Titanic, and if it had Jeffrey's tubes, it would have survived. I don't... I think... Maybe it was like Voyager in that one episode. Or no, that two-part episode. Was it a two-part episode? Or the, oh, yeah. the year from hell. Anyway, sorry. Moving on. Here we go. Uh, we're all Trekkies here. Oh, yeah. Except for the ones who aren't. Okay. So this area is the windowless space, or you know, the, the capstan machinery and all that. This is so, this is beyond me. I'm not even going to say anything. Go ahead. Yeah, Matt doesn't understand this. Uh, I, I do, so I'll explain it. You have these steam engines, right? Um, they do things with steam. And they make the gears go, whoop, and then they make the capstans turn around. And the that's cap, what these two engines do. The capstans on the deck above on the forecastle proper. Yeah, those big, uh, the, well, these things, really. They look oh, like there's this. one, yeah. I forgot there's a capstan in the space as well. And the windlasses are like capstans, but they, 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 they operate the anchor chains and the anchors. And these gears attached to the windlasses. And, uh, again, you have these two engines in the front. Now, the ones back here, they only operated the capstans. So they just had these relatively simple gear setups, which still looks complicated. It all looks uh, complicated. But the, uh, these two engines were designed to operate multiple things, and they have a little bit of redundancy. So they operated the regular capstans. They operated the windlasses. Slow down. They operated... Let's, let's, let's slow they down and appreciate everything. Take everything all in. Thank you. They operated the capstan. And they operated uh, this big wire drum, which could be used as a tow rope or for the center anchor. Oh, actually? I didn't even know that. <laughs> I, just, I, I, I seriously just remember. I just seriously just knew that now. And the thing about this is they... Yeah, as due to the multiple uses of these engines, this area had kind of a ridiculous layout of uh, gears and shafts. So you could engage and disengage different shafts. You could operate, you know, the different pieces of uh, machinery uh, depending on what you needed to do. So all the steam, because of this wonderful modern technology of a, of a steam engine, a steamship. All the steam from the boilers, of residual steam, was fed up from below that we saw earlier to these engines when necessary, when they were in ports yeah. to 
bring the ship in um, and tie her up to the dock to the quay and this is so all these those those large black and bronze topped capstans that you see on the poop deck and the forecastle deck that look just like that right there those turned they rotated they weren't stationary they moved when needed to which is one thing we never really think about um because we've never seen them move because we have so little footage of these ocean liners in actuality so it's very fascinating to know that there's these other engines down here under the forecastle deck there's engines under the forecastle deck there's engines under the poop deck there's engines all over the ship and you have the the, the little shafts for the gear uh, for the uh, chains to go through for the anchors, and uh, finally at the front of the ship, you know you have the base of the anchor crane, and you have a little uh, a little mooring bit here bollard, and the center hawser. This is the hole at the front of the ship. It's this is what it looked like from That's inside more or less. That's the hole at the front of Titanic. And that's what you would put the... Uh, this is how you would tow the ship if you needed to. Which And that's, that's about... That's about it for ends this. our tour of... Okay. So this is how you snowballed a little bit. Just a little bit. A little tiny bit. It's actually not even mm, technically over. There's like one or two little surprises left. And... This doesn't count a few other things that will also that have already been done for the 1.5 update, and uh, but I'm not getting it. One of them includes a new uh, first-class stateroom and uh, a few other surprises, hopefully. Yes. There's still. And that's my tour. Thank you for the tour. Uh, you you are two minutes early. Thank you. So we can focus on this and, and talk a little bit left. Talk a little bit more about. Um, you know how this came to fruition you enjoyed what you created here and i i've enjoyed the the outcome and i was surprised when you showed me this and how fast that you were able to accomplish a technical space such as the windless gear space which i was completely surprised that you made since for me any place with engines is something that i can't even wrap my no pun intended, wrap my head around. It's it's something that I never thought we'd ever see. There was a time, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, uh, people of all ages and genders and nationalities around the world, that I, I never expected us to have those coal bunkers and those coal spaces in Titanic Honor and Glory. I never, never thought... I we, we I told Kyle you don't need to, you don't need to put those coal bunkers in in the game. We're never going to explore those those spaces. Why we're, we're never going to have to go up there. Why would you why would you even think about that? And yet here they are in a crazy detail with with the trimming holes and the the railings around them and and coal spread about. So it's pretty it's pretty fascinating. And Kyle, as you show that off one last time, I'm going to switch gears for a minute. Well, for the rest of the evening, I guess. Because now, it's about time to begin. Because now it's 11.32 p.m. Sunday, 14th of April, 1912. And somehow, we're live 110 years ago. Let me turn that down just a little bit because there's a rumbling ship. We still have a little while until the ship hits the iceberg. And let's talk about our real time. By the way, Kyle, you can turn off your screen. Oh, you did. Thank you. Let's talk about our real-time sinking animation, which this isn't. This is actually just footage that Kyle's recorded of the ship sailing at night. And Kyle, can you talk about how the sinking animation came to be? Because, you know, it's now been six years since we've 
done this, you know, and it's the last time I checked YouTube was when I asked um, Betsy, who made that lovely uh, announcement image for us. I checked the the number of views, and it was I I actually already forgot 80 81 million views, I think. And I'm and you know that's something that none of us ever expected. As as popular as Titanic has become, it's it's we didn't think it, we could do anything that would become that popular. So you know now that you know that your because you animated that you know i might have helped you with research so anyone else could have done little bits or whatever but you animated that video yourself essentially and that was your model so looking back at that how do you feel six years later I never would have expected that it got that many views. It, it It's so many. I, I don't even know how many it has now. It's either 100 billion or like 90 million. It's I not 100 really billion, know. Kyle. There's not 100 billion people in the world. But yeah, it's got a lot of views. You, you can, it, well, hey, if a billion people watched it 100 times, hmm, think about it. Yeah, that'd be crazy. And, yeah. but, but in all seriousness. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it's... It, I, I just the, the way it came to be it, it generally the animation was it, there before that there existed some bits and pieces that we had in the project of uh, some sinking scenes but it wasn't a single narrative it wasn't something you could play start to finish uh, for the whole sinking and then we were kind of coming up on the anniversary and what was it 2016 and we, we didn't we weren't sure what we were going to do, and then we just kind of decided in a, in a team meeting one day, what if we uh, had a Titanic animation? Problem. We don't have a Titanic animation. Solution. We'll make one. And so, we got to work. And over the course of basically about four or five days, I animated this just... Whoop. It was... It was... And then it was done. And, you know, I... There, there was extra work that had to be done uh, for a little, uh, for like sound editing and stuff like that. Uh, but they the the raw like animations. I, I basically I, I made it in UE4, uh, the very early version of UE4 in the matinee editor that they had. It's complicated to explain. It, it's a bunch of like animation keys and tracks and stuff like that, and for the movements of the ship and particles and lights and stuff like that, and. Uh, then I had to animate the camera and record it, and it was, it was a whole thing, and it was a lot of work stuffed into a time in which I slept very little, and it was at the time it was just it was such a cool thing to pull off. It wasn't perfect, you know, it lacked uh, a lot of details, but it was it was something for the anniversary, and by the time everything was done and the video was uh, rendered. There was very little time to upload it, so it was brought up in uh, 720p, I think, uploaded. So that's why it's like that. Yeah, I, I, I just had, I had, a, I had the issue tonight where I just quickly rendered this, and it literally finished rendering 20 minutes before we started the stream. So hope I, if there's any errors in this, I've never even watched it, so it's fine. But, you know, we, we, oh, well. we do what we got to do sometimes when we decide to just make things last minute. So, um uh, we, we here at THD love to be last minute. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, I want to pretty um, shout out to Matthew. Uh, thank you. And also to K, KK. Uh, thank you guys for your super chats. And also uh, a quick um, little announcement, just in case, you know, if you guys, if it's two minutes fast, or we're, you know, it might be because of the stream delay um, or if it's slow. You know, I've started exactly at the same time as the ship is synced with my watch. So I'm pretty certain it's correct and we'll see. So, and if it is, I can just pause it. So we'll see. I'm, you know, I've got, I've, I'm, I'm checking it. So I'll let you know, I'll let you know. Hey, we, we are the controllers of time here. The we can unsync the Titanic if we want. You cannot. So yeah, the Titanic hits the iceberg at 10.38 p.m. our time, my time, which is 
right now. Um, oh, I better start my animation. You better start your animation. Wait, not yet. Hang on. No, 10.38. Oh, yeah, in two minutes. And in two minutes, it's 11.40. It's 10.36 p.m. my time in New York. I'm not in New York. I'm somewhere else. But according to this little watch I have right here, it is 11.38. So I think we're right in the money. So I'm sorry to cut you off, Kyle, in your nice explanation of everything. And yeah, I think we're right on the money. And as I was told, so... Thank you guys. Yeah, 10:36 is the time right now. Titanic. It's it's two hours and two minutes difference. You got to think about the time difference because of daylight savings if you're in New York and etc. But this is the scene. I, I didn't download the notes, Kyle. But this is the scene that you'd see from the crow's nest. Reginald Lee and Frederick Fleet just spot the haze on the horizon, and they look out to see what it is, and they're going to ring that bell three times. So let's listen in. Well, of course they're not gonna, they're not actually there because we haven't made NPCs. But still, let's take a look and remember this moment, 110 years ago, right now. And just like that, we've struck the iceberg. Titanic's engines were put to stop. The helm hard to starboard. And now we're hard to port. And those spaces that we've seen that Kyle showed us earlier have been open to the sea. Rivets pops, hull plates separated, and the water has begun entering the ship. And now, I'm going to open the notes that Kyle sent me so that I don't say anything ridiculous. So there are 2,000... Can you all hear me? Oh, I hope so. There are 2,208 people aboard Titanic. And of those 2,208 people, there are very few who have actually were awake to feel the iceberg or were awoken by this collision with the iceberg. It was very gentle for a collision with a, a gigantic berg that size. Now, of course, there were many questions I saw earlier asking, or many statements, I should say, that was suggesting that the ship should have just gone straight into the iceberg instead of trying to turn to avoid the iceberg. Now, I'm not going to bring that up so much because that's all a lot of... We weren't there. It's, yeah, well... it's difficult to understand and put yourself in that situation. Of course, we have hindsight and the ability to say that we should have done it this way. It would have been different if that happened. But if you short, go ahead, Kyle, while I download your notes finally. The, the, the short version is no sane person would have ever just directed the ship into the iceberg. Your instinct is always going to be to turn. Because uh, why would you even think about doing something like that? Your instinct is always going to be to turn. It might be worth talking about just the general nature of the um, 
collision and uh, the turning. So, uh, one thing is sort of the the thing with the lookouts. Um, you, you you would be tempted to think if they had binoculars, maybe they could uh, you know avoid the iceberg. But that's not really how that worked. Like, you don't sit there in the crow's nest using your binoculars in the middle of a dark, moonless night. Because where would you even look? You look directly ahead, obviously. That's what you want to do. But it, the binoculars don't really help your vision that much. And I mean, there were tests that were done. Yeah, basically, but it's... binoculars are there to to um, determine what you what it yeah, is that you, you've you seen. Spot, yeah, you spot something first, and then you use the binoculars to get a closer look at it. You don't use binoculars to spot things, and so that. For, it's right away, that wouldn't have helped at all. And, uh, you know, of course, they warned the bridge, and, and they started the turn. And, you know, by the time they started the turn, the ship had already been very close to the berg. There's virtually no time to actually do it, any of the stuff that they did. And, you know, it's... There's no real reason to think... That, for example, that we're unsure these days, you know, what, what happened with the with the engine orders exactly and stuff like that. But even if, even if they had tried to say reverse the engines or something like that, there just would have been no time to actually make that happen. Of course, you saw in the animation how quickly it happened. Like the propellers, they probably wouldn't have even stopped yet and if they ordered full stop they still probably wouldn't have been totally stopped that's how quickly it happened when i when i try to explain to just people i encounter you know when i when i when i'm told by somebody oh they i have this person loves titanic talk to titanic, talk titanic with them I'm like oh gosh here i go i have to try to explain something that i can't uh, <laughs> actually talk about uh you know they they bring up like these things which are great questions um but they're they're myths and um legends which are permeated throughout time because we it's a, it tells a good story and there's going to be a lot of those um that we're going to probably discuss tonight and one of those are the binoculars um but like you mentioned kyle the truth of the matter is titanic's lookouts they spotted the iceberg too, it was too late, and that's not because of the binoculars, just because, you know, um, and the ship was going, unfortunately, too fast, and that's, again, we'll discuss that later on, probably. It's not the fault of anybody who was there, really. It's just how things were done at the time, and, again, hindsight is 2020. Um, but then you you even have the weather that night. We can discuss right now as we see this, this, this starlit sky. Um, the weather, there's no moon. There's no moon out there right now. There's no... Um, Aura Borealis from, as in Britannic Patroness of the Mediterranean available now on Steam uh, and one of the things that made it, made it more difficult to spot the iceberg is the Mirage theory which is it, a very um, sound theory where um, that I, if I understand it the water temperature which is 28 degrees Fahrenheit um, I, I can't tell you the Celsius because I'm from the United States, but it's 28 degrees Fahrenheit. It's just, it's below freezing. And that helps to create a mirage with the, with the Labrador currents meeting up with the, the Gulf Stream, um, cooling from the bottom up. Thank you for these notes, Kyle. Creating a thermal inversion, which would have likely created a mirage, which would have hidden the iceberg. Um, if I'm in, if I misconstrued your Kyle has all these wonderful notes everybody, um, he has 65 pages 65 pages of notes that he wrote up all himself of, of Titanic. Um, he could write, he could you could write a book about this, and um, I'm just gonna go off of these wonderful books. Kyle did the notes. I all I did all I do here is is ramble, and I I mean this this mirage theory it's still just a theory because. It's, it hasn't been 100% proven, unlike certain things which are proven. The, the switch theory is proven um, false, by the way. And the mirage theory could have hidden the iceberg, thus dooming the ship. There's so many things that were against Titanic 
making it impossible for her to be saved once the, the impact of the iceberg had happened. That's what causes a disaster in the in the first place. Little little events coming together to cause one titanic size disaster, and that's what you have the night of April 14th, morning of April 15th. Let's see. So right now, at this point, the ship would be either stopped or, or going slow ahead. Because the, the, after the collision, they, for whatever reason, they decided to go slow ahead for a few minutes. And it, after that point, they had finally ordered full stop, and that was essentially the, the, the that was the last time Titanic's engines ran. And. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, you know, we could, re if we revisit the collision itself for a moment, there are a lot of uh, interesting stories from the passengers at the time. You know, some passengers had felt several jolts, and, uh, you know, some of them saw the, quote, ghostly wall of white, you know, passing by the ship. Yeah, you know, there's, uh, uh, you know, passenger George Rimes had uh, come out of a bathroom, and, uh, you know, they had felt a bump and turned around and there was the iceberg coming past the window at the end of a corridor. And there was uh, passenger Edward Kimball in first class was in stateroom uh, D-19. And he heard this scraping and tearing sound and then suddenly, whoosh, pieces of ice and stuff came in through the porthole and that had to be scary. And this happened, I think, one or two other instances, something like that. Like you, you, there were people in these rooms right against the hall with portholes facing the iceberg, and that had to be something. Yeah, you know, Jack there was getting ready for bed in C sixty six, and you know he felt the collision, uh, but he thought it just, yeah, you know, it just he just swayed a bit, uh, but he could sense that the ship had kind of veered a little bit. Uh, to port, yeah, Major Arthur Pugin had uh, he was getting ready for bed in C-104. You know, he sensed something, and yeah, he became just immediately suspicious, and because he thought, well, the sea is calm, that's weird. So you know, he got dressed and he left his room to check out what happened. And it, it's you know that there's a, a Philadelphian named Emma Bucknell who was in D-15 starboard side. You know, she felt a jar, thunder, a shock, you know, as if the bottom of the ship had been torn out. And uh, she saw the berg pass the porthole. And there were just so many stories like that. You could go on and on. You know, people in the smoke room, you know, they felt something. It felt like the ship was rolling over a thousand marbles. And, you know, in the it, the experiences varied. You could be in a place where, you, like, some people claim that they had been thrown out of their beds and... Others barely felt it, if at all. And of it course, really depended where you were. Oh, sorry, I'll yeah. go. On. Oh, go. Oh, go on. I, I guess it really depended where you were in the ship, because I mean, those who were lower down and closer to the bow, you're going to feel it a lot more. Whereas those higher up, say like first class, and depending where they were in the ship, it's going to feel like uh, I can't remember exactly who said it, but Walter Law said in his book that someone said that they felt like they were landing, uh, like their their boats that they previously felt in the past, and it just felt a little bump. But no, exactly, you're right with the whole thing of just depending where you are on the ship, it's going to feel different for everyone else, but. So obviously some people are going to go away from the event and exaggerate what was happening because of course everyone's going to want to hear the story of what happened, how did it happen, but <clears throat> you obviously have to take some of these um, witness eyewitness accounts with just a little bit of pinch of salt. Yeah. Now, we can also talk about the watertight doors. Uh, obviously after the collision, you know, the uh, first officer Mur Murdoch went to the watertight door control uh, the switch on the bridge, you know, it, what he would have done was he would have uh, first hit a switch for a warning bell, which uh, they, there were these warning bells next to the watertight doors down in the boiler rooms and so on. And then a few seconds later, he would have hit the switch to start shutting the doors. Now, you kind of had this picture that you might get from the movies of 
the the men being trapped in the boiler rooms and engine rooms as the doors came down. Um, that's not true at all. Every single compartment, watertight compartment, even the, uh, the the shaft tunnels for the propellers, everything had a way of escaping. Boiler rooms you saw in the uh, 401 update, they all had ladders going up. You know, you could get to Scotland Road from there, or you could get all the way to the top of the ship, to the boat deck, to the tops of the houses. There were hatches. There were ways for all the firemen to escape, multiple ways. You know, it, it's fine. And if they were in a room that wasn't flooded, you know, then they could just open the doors if they needed to. And, and they did later in some cases. And... Uh, yeah, even places, you know, that, that little anteroom to Boiler Room 6, with the pump in it that you also saw, even that tiny little space, there was an escape shaft with the ladder that went up to Scotland Road, so you could get out from there even. Same with the uh, the, 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 the propeller shaft tunnels. Like, there were escape ladders out of all of those. There were ways to escape. They were fine. Yeah, they could get out. But the doors, I want to say thank you to the everybody who's asking questions and giving us super chats. It's, it was I don't want to miss them. Um, to, to Vortex plays who loves Titanic. Um, to Albie Dam who asked the theory about being able to get on the iceberg. That's a good interesting question. How viable would that have been? I don't think it would have been viable to convince um, to <laughs> to convince any of the first class ladies to get onto an iceberg but thank you all for um getting on uh, as, getting onto our channel tonight and joining us for this anniversary stream once we get into the i don't want to say the l less interesting parts but this the parts of the stream where it gets a little bit more calm during the sinking we'll, we'll definitely be able to focus on you guys and answer questions um but one thing that the Waterhead doors did that we don't usually see, Kyle. Is it, is it true that they had to slam shut at the end to make sure they created a watertight seal in sense? Yeah, yeah, the doors, they kind of, they lowered kind of slowly as they went down, but for the last foot or so, they just dropped straight down and to ensure a tight seal. So in the in yeah. most of the movies that we see, we see them slowly closing down, click 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 click, and 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 the guys in the boiler rooms are running, which looks like f for their lives almost, and and their their feet just get get through those closing watertight doors at the last second, and they go click 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 shut, but that last second they would have gone shut and slammed, and if you're and they're specifically designed that if there's something in the way, those heavy, they must weigh a ton. I don't know. I don't know steel, the way steel, but they must weigh a good deal because they're designed to do that slamming shut to crush what's in the way yeah. to create that watertight seal. Um, that seems a little bit more scary and intense to me than the slow, methodical, yeah. mechanical closing of a watertight door when you have that crunch and you shut. And hearing that boom, boom, boom of watertight door slamming, which Murdoch rightfully closed those doors. So that's why there's a warning bell, perhaps, not to, to warn the men down there that, hey, you got to get out of there, but to stay clear of these doors. They're coming down. Yeah, that, that would essentially be uh, it. Um... Because you just you just don't want to be in the path of these doors. You don't want to be in the path of those doors. No, I mean that that's I'm pretty sure someone on the Queen Mary had tried that and uh, they they didn't fare very well. Yeah, that's uh, I think that's a story that you definitely get when you tour the Queen Mary, which everyone should do. If Queen Mary is open, I'm not, I I don't know if Queen Mary is open. So uh, because of the pandemic, I hope she is soon uh, with everything that's going on. Um, I know Titanic is coming to a stop soon. I can see her s slowing down. It's almost like it's coming up on midnight on April. It'll be April 15th soon. Um, and a lot of things will happen. So there's going to be a lot of... There won't be a lot much... There won't be much more downtime for us. Um, we're going to have to start talking about events and everything. Um, I want to quickly address the question that the Q-Tip asked. Thank you, by the way, for your support, Q-Tip. You have a fun name. Um, and we're, we're going to be bringing this up a lot. Um, 
throughout the evening as we discuss the escape routes for passengers and crews, which Kyle just just um, brought up in detail for the men. They're all men down below decks. Um, isn't it true that third class passengers had no way to access the boat deck? That is true during, throughout the entire voyage that they were kept down below because that's where their quarters were below from the boat decks. Um, the boat deck is the top deck of Titanic where you see the boat decks, or excuse me, where you see the, the life boats right there and you see that the funnels, the funnels sit on the top of the houses. The houses are those little square rectangle deck time, the deck houses. Um, that's the boat deck. Third class, they're, most top decks were the poop deck and the well decks. Um, those little smaller divots between the superstructure of the ship and the forecastle. That's as high up as third class were allowed to go on Titanic. And since the ship is segregated due to the the social structure, quote unquote, and the um, requirements for preventing infectious disease and the United States rules and regulations, etc. Um, but during the sinking, um, of course, all this goes out the window because safety does have to come into play, and we'll discuss that. And we're also going to discuss the myth, the many myths that perpetrated throughout the years of locked gates, um, shooting of passengers, uh, so many different things. We're going to try to dip our, our toes in. Um, but we're nearing midnight on the night of, I guess it's now going to become the morning of the 15th. And then the ship is coming to a stop. And so... It might be worth talking... Yeah, go ahead, Kyle. ...about, about the uh, damage uh, at this point I'm glad and you the read flooding. my mind, yes. So what's happening down there? What do we got? Well... Well, you know, when the Berg struck the hull, of course, you saw in the animation, it, it hit the lower starboard side below the waterline. Uh, of course, it didn't leave a giant gash in the hull. It, it was mainly bent plates, popped rivet seams, popped rivets, uh, little gaps in the plates, uh, ranging for about one to six inches. There's... From various uh, sources, inspections of the wreck, the sonar mappings of the hull uh, beneath the mud, it's it, it seems that it was mainly about trace damage along the forward peak tank, uh, enough to cause the tank in the first watertight compartment to flood. Uh, and then you had a, basically a five and six foot openings in the area of the number one hold on the overlap deck opening the second watertight compartments. And then he had a 16-foot opening running across watertight bulkhead B, a 33-foot a opening across watertight bulkhead C, and uh, the 16-foot one uh, flooded the third and fourth watertight compartments. Uh, a, then he had a 45-foot opening running through most of the fifth watertight compartment, uh, causing that to flood. This op opening also extended slightly past watertight bulkhead E into the sixth watertight compartment, and, you know, this fits with the testimony of all the involves Edward Wilding. And uh, he is just basically, he, his idea was that the ship had kind of, when it hit the berg, there were a series of steps kind of along the hall instead of one long gash. And uh, it seems that he was correct in this assumption. And all in all, you had, you know, about six or so areas of damage uh, with... Uh, Intermittent, intermittent contact with the iceberg and uh, there were six compartments total open to the sea two more than it was designed to 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 take and uh, even if it was just five uh, that was more than it could handle and it's estimated that the total area of the openings and the damage in total was about 12 square feet which is about the size of a doorway just a regular doorway. That's that's about it. Like through that area, water started pouring into the ship across six different compartments, and you know it's any one of these on their own, it wouldn't have sunk the ship or even mm. two to four compartments. But it was just too much. And even though boiler room five was breached, and they were able to control the flooding with pumps, it was just not 
you know, once the, the the flooding reached that from over the water type bulkhead from the the forward compartments, it's just the ship was lost. There's no way they could have stopped it. Ships aren't designed to take a a side swiping impact with anything. No matter how well designed, so I this is lately this month. Uh, I, this is when I get into arguments with people on social media about Titanic, and <laughs> one of them. One of the arguments was, you know, Titanic was a, a poorly designed ship um, because she sank, etc. She was a weak ship. She had the weak rivets, the weak steel, the weak design, what have you, just because she sank. Now, of course, again, this is the hindsight, etc., what, what have you, but if if any given cruise ship, any, any ship that's perhaps besides a battle cruiser or a dreadnought, has roughly 300 feet of damage, or I guess the 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 size of a door and square footage of damage spread out along that length of hull. It's it's going to be a f possibly fatal to the ship. However, Titanic was, as we stated earlier, designed fitted out with these the most technologically advanced for the time safety features from those watertight doors which had possibly six different methods to close them and you know you could close it from the bridge instead of having to run down to the the lower decks and manually turn a gear to to close the watertight doors there was the most this was the most sophisticated ocean vessel in the world at the time so it's it's very difficult for any of these passengers, even the crew, the captain, to comprehend the the, the dangers and especially comprehend the, the very close coming dangers um, in the minutes ahead. And we're going to discuss that when the lifeboats are attempted to be filled with passengers and nobody, very few people, wishes to get in them because they would rather stay on board the safe Titanic than go into an open boat. So I want to go back to our our chat real quick because there's a lot of questions going. Um, I, I I want to before I get to the super chats, I've seen one question that's popped up a lot, and that's what is the green light for on the side of the ship? And I think that's the same as someone else asked about what is the green light for on the green and red lights for on the sides of the ship? Um, Kyle, what are they for? And I'm, I'm I believe they're talking about the running lights. Yep, they're running lights. They're they're there to uh, indicate which direction the ship is moving when you're looking at it. If you're looking at a ship and you see a green light, then you're probably looking at it head on, and it's pro it's going to be you know its front end is going to be to your right. It's probably going to be heading that way. If you see a red light, you're looking at that you're looking at the ship from the port side, and it's probably going in the other direction. And if you see a green and a red light. Uh, it's probably coming towards you, and you want to get out of the way. <laughs> I guess yes. Uh, there's very similar to what aircraft have on their wings, uh, if I believe. Yeah. I'm not 100% positive. I don't. I'm not. A, yeah, aircraft it, have them. Uh, yeah. Most. I mean, it's a pretty standard feature on an aircraft ships. Uh, even Star Trek ships have them. Okay, here we go again. It all. It all. It all circles back. Okay, that's that answers that question. Um, there's a couple other questions. I don't want. I would want them to go away before I miss them. How do I make this bigger? Okay, good. Um, from Vigor, um, a question about the research of the paintings on the grand staircase. Oh boy, goodness. That's a question that has nothing to do with the sinking, but um, th th that's that's a question that um, can't be answered easily during this stream. But um, it's a it's a tough subject, and it's a subject that's um, has caused a lot of internal strife in the research department, so it's not set in stone yet on on our side. So don't worry. <laughs> um, but yeah, we I believe there's paintings on board the ships originally. Um, that's my personal opinion based on research from Britannic and Olympic, uh, not Titanic of course, because Titanic sank. Um, I think I just lost the super chat. I apologize. Um, ben, thank you. Hurricane. Hurricane. 
Um, two questions. Could the ship have turned faster if they only reversed the engines on one side? And could the Titanic have turned and sailed towards the California to get everyone off? Um, I believe that the answer is no to both those questions. Kyle, if you can answer them in a quick... If you if you know the answer quickly, I don't think... I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer quickly. All I, all I can really say is that I, I, I don't know for sure. I believe that I, I believe that if they tried sailing, to, I know the second part of the question, Hurricane, is oh, yeah, that the if, second one isn't gonna happen. No, because um, one of the things that happens if you sail t while with damage with an opening on your sh on your vessel, um, it's going to cause the intake of water to be increased. So you're going to have more water flowing on the side of your ship and on your hull, and it's going to enter the ship more. So you're you're going to increase. Um, the flooding is going to happen more rapidly, so it would actually be counterintuitive, unfortunately. Um, and, and at that same time, you can't launch lifeboats. It's what um, Charles Bartlett, Captain Bartlett, had to try to figure out what to do when Britannic hit the mine um, t four years later. Four years later? Four years later in the Aegean Sea. And he had to make a choice when to finally stop the engines and start loading the lifeboats because he was so close to the shore of the island of Kea. Um, what else is there? The Snooty Nose Kid. What devices can I download um, Demo 401 on? You need a desktop computer right now because our because we're only able to do it on a, a desktop computer. Unfortunately, it's not a Mac. That's the easiest thing. Uh, the easiest method I can say to describe that process. Unfortunately, we're a limited, small team. Everybody. Uh, Regardless of how amazing Kyle's modeling work is and Derek's and programming stuff is and the research team is, at the end of the day, we're still only able to do so much, even though we try to do so, so such grandiose things. But, um, and thank you for your patience on that matter. Um, what's the ship that the um, Albidam has been giving so much? And I don't think I've been saying her, their name right. Albidam. <laughs> I've been saying it like I'll be damned, which is a quote from the movie, which I won't say properly. Um, what was up with the ship that people saw on the horizon? It's the California. Uh, it they they didn't come to the rescue for a number of reasons, and we will definitely be discussing that once the California comes into play later on. So make sure we mention that, which we will. Vortex plays. Thank you again. Your mum. Wouldn't it actually happen a few hours ago? Um, this is we are doing this to the time that Titanic was in her own time zone. Um, when Titanic was sailing across the Atlantic Ocean, her clock was reset a couple of times as the ship was passing time zones heading west. And due to a number of reasons, Titanic's clock was set for 11.40 p.m. about um, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 30 minutes ago, um, roughly 30 minutes ago. And... Um, well, I'm, well, I'm saying this, it's actually 12, 11 a.m. Titanic time. And due to daylight savings time in the United States, etc., it's roughly um, an two hours and two minutes difference, or an hour and two minutes difference. Uh, but we know, based on a lot of research, it took a lot of years to get this right. And there's always a lot of arguments, but the difference between the, the time is synced right now. So this is indeed live to the time zone that Titanic has herself. I, uh, I believe it's called ATS. We, in the Titanic community, we call that Titanic's time zone. Is it ATS? If Kyle, if you know that. I don't know that, but there are a few things we need to talk about because we're Please. starting to get into the we're getting uh, various into times of we're thinking. Getting, let me just quickly finish these. Um, Super chats because so, I, yeah, thank you, real Joker. If this was the Mauritania Lusitania, oh god, I think she would have survived. That's my my personal opinion. Um, br br eight j eight. Is it true that there's a cat on board? Uh, there might have been a cat named Jenny, but I don't think that's been 100% proven. But there definitely wasn't a kitty cat on board when the ship sank. And um, Feis, the Feis. When did the Captain Smith know the ship was doomed? It's about to happen, I believe. Yeah, we're coming up on that. We'll and, get there. And Jerry? Oh, that's an interesting question, Jerry, which I don't know if I could answer with dynamics um, because of the plating of the ship. 
but that's an interesting question. Their question was, what if the ship sailed back? I don't think the ship would have been able to go as fast backwards. So I don't think that would have oh, no. that would have happened. But yeah, I don't know if I can freeze super chats. Actually, I would if I could have, I would. But um, you could. thank you for. I, I, nice. I promise we're going to answer regular questions too. Um, but let's, uh, Kyle, tell us what's happening, and then we'll answer some normal questions. Normal questions. Uh, I, I don't mean to call it normal I, questions, but questions yeah, from, I, I believe from everybody. Ben, I believe Ben was trying to say something, Ben? No, I'm just saying that we've missed an awful lot of events. I, I wanted to try and go back yeah. to 11.50 in the mailroom, but um, that might have gotten a bit quick now. Um, I can quickly rush through that if you want. Yeah, go ahead. Talk about the mailroom and some of the other, uh, if you want. So, yeah, um, where are we now? We're about just after midnight. But um, ten minutes after the sinking started, you water began to fill into the ship's mailroom. Now, the mail was really important for the White Star because it was part of how they made their money. And so um, a lot of travel was used. And why, it's why also called the ship was RMS. It was a Royal Mail steamer. But because the, where the mail was kept in the ship, it filled so quickly and the postal workers reportedly tried in vain to haul the heavy sacks of mail up the stairs to the higher decks and unfortunately none of the postal workers actually survived the sinking so they, with a lot of the crew of the ship, actually went down trying to save a lot of the mail but also just trying to save themselves they didn't actually make it off the ship um, but then so much more comes after that and so we start to have events taking place with Andrews being sent off to go and check the ship, the carpenter's sent, and Smith is just trying to rack his brains around what's happening with the ship. People have said that he was all over the place. They've seen him looking around, looking at the damage that we mentioned earlier, and um, I'll hand it back over to Carl now just to carry on with events that will be happening um, around about now. Uh, by around midnight... Passengers are getting roused. Uh, many were already awake w when the, the collision happened, and you know, it just kind of continued through uh, the night as things were ramping up with the lifeboats. Uh, by midnight, uh, even before Smith got the news that Titanic would sink, he, uh, he ordered the pre preparations on the lifeboats to start uh, sometime after midnight. And now... You know, at this point, the preparation of the lifeboats was, you know, they were kept between the davits, they had canvas covers, they had their oars and sails and stuff inside. So they'd have to get these covers off, they'd have to, they'd have to undo these chains, they'd have to do a whole bunch of stuff, and they'd have to kind of raise them a bit, they'd need to swing out the davits with the boats, and, uh, you know, take down the chocks, which the boats sat on on the deck, and all kinds of little bits and, and, and bits and odds and sounds like that and uh, they would have uh, crewmen would have been sent to gather supplies for the boats you, know, you would have had hard tack uh, the passengers would have eaten uh, the little provisions and you would have had lan lanterns and stuff like that uh, the lifeboats also had these little holes in the bottom to ensure that rainwater wouldn't build up in the boats when they're being stored on deck and you had to put plugs in them before you lowered them, and uh, a few of these were forgotten as they were lowered, and that would come up uh, later in the sinking. And uh, you know, once the boats were ready and swung out over the side, uh, they were brought down to deck level. Uh, now, when the lifeboat designs were conceived, the, the idea was that you would load them from a deck, not the boat deck. You lowered them from the boat deck to a deck, and the passengers would board from there. Uh, this was an issue on Titanic because of the screen that they added on forward A deck. So you had a situation where, I think it was in the case of Boat 4, they lowered it down to A deck. And the windows were in the way, and they were like, uh, hey, we gotta get someone to get the key for this window, and so we can open it. And it took a while before someone was able to do that. So it just hung there for a, for a long time during the night. Meanwhile, other boats, they would load them from the boat deck, and, and some aft boats, you know, they were able to load from a deck because it was open. Now, what time is it currently, Matt? It just um, passed 12.17 a.m. All right. So a couple of minutes ago, around, uh, around about this time, uh, Titanic's eight musicians or so 
the five piece and the three piece ensembles, they they were starting to play around this time, about twelve fifteen to twelve twenty, and it's. You know, they were spotted walking up the forward grand staircase with their instruments at one point. And, uh, you know, perhaps the purser requested them or the captain, you know, maybe to keep them calm. Who knows? Uh, where the band played is subject to debate, of course, where they played first. You know, they may have played in the first class lounge in A deck or on the boat deck level of the forward grand staircase. Um, we don't know. Uh, there was a. Steinway upright piano on the boat deck of the Grand Staircase, so you know, maybe they played there. Uh, popular myth and depictions had the band playing their music on the boat deck outside the uh, Port Grand Staircase, of course. Uh, but there's kind of a lack of evidence for this. So, all things considered, it seems possible, though, that they played from inside uh, the top of the grand staircase. Right. They didn't go out until the very end. I want to briefly bring up, I know that there's a lot going on, but the the forward three funnels are venting steam right now, and they have been for, I think, 20 minutes or so. Um, and that is to get rid of the excess steam, because the we, we saw all those um, boilers that you created in Boiler Room 6 and 5 earlier in the stream, Kyle and there's excess steam that was the ship has now stopped so the steam that was going to be supplied for the engines need to go somewhere or we're going to have a problem pretty much and they're going to get rid of that steam by sending it out through the the large pipes that are on the forward and aft end of funnels one two and three the fourth funnel is it's the quote unquote um, dummy funnel. It's not connected to the any boilers. It's connected to um, it, it ventilates different rooms, bathrooms. It ventilates galleys, etc. That's why you don't see smoke proper coming out of it. But there is steam being ejected rather forcibly and it's somewhat deafening for, um, for some of the passengers and crew and it's going to be um, a hindrance somewhat um, for a while now. And the time right now uh, it is 12:20 a.m. I'll, I'll try to keep that. I'll try to keep mentioning what time it is for our sake, Kyle and Ben. And by by this time, the bow had sunk low enough that the portholes uh, that were a set of portholes that were previously 20 feet above the water were now going under. And on e deck e deck forward around this time, Seaman John Poindexter was in his quarters to put he was putting boots on and a wooden uh bulkhead caved in and just a bunch of water came flooding in up to about three feet deep yeah Oof. obviously he got out of there pretty quickly yeah i think that at this point certain passengers it's 1221 certain passengers and crew depending on where you are uh you have no idea really what's what's going on with the ship we're gonna i think there's going to be a couple discussions about a, a certain quartermaster on the very aft end of Titanic who has no idea what's happening. Uh, but th some other passengers uh, and crew have a, t a great understanding of how perilous the situation is. Um, and one of those people who have a full understanding is Thomas Andrews. Thomas Andrews was sent down by the request of Captain Smith to look and, and see what the damage was in the in the forward section of the ship and now he's go going back to the bridge to deliver the news to Smith that the ship is doomed but as you can see the ship has a definitive list to both the front of the ship the bow and also it has a slate list to starboard right now um, because the ship hit the ship the ship hit the iceberg mm. on the starboard side about five degrees. Um, ben. Yeah. So um, 
obviously as the ship settles it levels off and before it starts taking a port list later on in the sinking partially to do with the whole layout of the ship with scotland road but it's been argued that the port list was from the car fire and may have saved titanic from actually capsizing see ships usually tend to capsize when they sink even if the flooding is even at first and the buoyancy is lost and the stability is getting worse now apparently in modern simulations titanic kept capsizing as it flooded which as we know from history and survivor accounts it didn't but when the initial port list was factored in it did not capsize now nobody will ever know the truth of the port list on titanic that night but if it's even remotely true then it's possible the coal fire may have helped the titanic last longer rather than make it sink faster because without the stability that she had from in the sinking things might have ended much much sooner and at the very least it would have been impossible to launch half the lifeboats at a certain point and now we have to remember that almost all the lifeboats were able to get away only four actually washed off the ship at the end so it, even if you're arguing with this coal fire and everything that happened on the ship it actually helped with the sinking now um, I'm not sure what time we've just come up to a second ago but we are now coming up to the time where it was the famous meeting between Thomas Andrews and Smith on the bridge and so uh, around 12.22 a.m. on the morning of April 15th Andrews is seen rushing up the grand staircase it's 12.24 right now terror on his face ah thank you I'll feed up a little bit then um, he just finished the damage inspection and flooding calculations and Titanic was sinking he knew that and this man knows this ship by the back of his hand and he knows that this ship is doomed so there's nothing that can stop it and it, it was, as put in the movie, a mathematical certainty. At 12.25, so in one minute, Smith and Andrews met on the bridge, and Andrews told Smith the first six compartments were breached, though the sixth one was under control at the moment. However, it would not last long. With just five compartments flooded, the water spilled over the bulkheads further and further, back and back until all ability to float the buoyancy was gone. Andrews calculated the Titanic had an hour from this point. Now, don't forget, this is 12.25. We are now just under 50 minutes since the iceberg collision the ship's still got an hour and a bit left but he's got a general calculation of an hour and a half and smith would have been shocked at this point he he knows he said a few years ago that on the adriatic that he could not conceive of any eventuality in modern shipbuilding that could sink a modern ship and yet here he is he is in the commodore in charge of the newest ship in the world the, the pride of the white star and it's going down so he gets into shock, doesn't know what to do, but um, straight away, Smith, he's been in control, he's been on the water for a very long career at this point, and he immediately gave the orders to put women and children into the lifeboats in order, which was overheard by an aforementioned and John, oh, it was mentioned by John, uh, I might pronounce this wrong, uh, Poeing Dizer, and as he arrived on the deck, which women and children was a very common thing at the time. I'm going to pass it back over to Matt to take us through um, about women and children first. Certainly. I, I, I want to um, quickly, uh, I, it's 12.26 a.m. on April 15, 1912. There's there's so much going on, as, as Ben just said, you know, put yourself into the shoes of Captain Smith if you if you, if you you dare do such a thing. It's, it's a difficult situation. Um, that he's in and it's impossible to really just wrap your head around um this, this this is a man who has so much experience and and now this 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 situation has been thrown at his feet and you know in media that we've had for so many years um in movies and in plays and in certain books we've always been um We've always been given the message that Smith was an inept leader, in, in to a certain degree, that he's. But we were going to see that Smith has done a lot of um, things correct, and soon he's going to be giving out orders um, to get the. He's already given out a, a, several orders. He immediately, immediately asked for the ship to be inspected, etc. He's going to be giving out a first distress call from the wireless of course the position is going to be wrong unfortunately which is not smith's doing but it's just a miscalculation i believe on the on boxhall's um charting of the stars 
Um, however, there is a couple of super chats that I missed. I um, apologize. There's a lot going on in the world of Titanic 110 years ago. Uh, there's there's so much to talk about that happens when Titanic sinks. You it you, you don't realize how fast events occurred on Titanic. Uh, I don't even remember what time it was. So it just just passes by. I think it's around 12:30 almost or 12:27. Um, and we've already had the inspection of the ship. It's 12:28 a.m. We've already had the inspection of the ship. The 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 meeting between Smith and Andrews. Oh. We've had so much going on, and it's and and there's still more to go. Um, so yeah. Yep. Uh, now we're at the point where they send out the CQD. That was at 12:27. The, 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 the first CQ, the first call. It wasn't it wasn't SOS at first, everybody. Um, so yeah, it was CQD. So if you guys can put CQD in the chat as a mark as um, in what the heck is it called in <laughs> in uh, Morse code, that's more impressive. So yes, um, CQD, 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 MGY. MGY is Titanic's identification. Um, she was calling out for help. Jack there, um, Jack there. Excuse me. I'm, I I pretend to be a Titanic historian. Jack Phillips um, calling out for um, assistance. He indeed had the incorrect um, calculation of Titanic's position. Um, eventually, in about 10 minutes or so, Boxell is going to amend his positioning. There's those CQDs and MG, those CQDs and MGYs. Yep. Very good, very good, everybody. I appreciate that a lot. So Here's it's a fun fact. It's a little uh, too late though, for Titanic. Yep. Now CQD, you might think it means come quickly, distress, and no, no, it doesn't. Oh. Uh, the letters CQ, it, it was a standard uh, wireless code at the time. Okay, everyone's got to everyone's got to calm down the Morse code because YouTube's gonna. As YouTube's going to yell at you, so everyone, we gotta. Put, I'm gonna put a stop message on this on the on the on the Morse. Stop on the Morse. Stop on the Morse. End message. Sorry. <laughs> so everyone's sending CQD. You don't even know what it means. So yeah. here's what it means. CQ stands for all stations, and D stands for distress. So you call CQ, all stations, everyone. We're in distress, basically, is what it means. And, you know, at this time, you know, ships are starting to hear the messages. The Carpathia answers the distress calls relatively soon. And, you know, the, the Carpathia tells Titanic she'll arrive in four hours. You know, four hours! Uh, thank you, Brian. And, well, we, yeah, it's we, well we beyond the time. Yeah. <laughs> it's well beyond the time uh, Titanic was expected to uh, stay afloat, obviously. Right. But, yeah, Cap Captain Rostron, you know, he Im immediately orders Carpathia steam full speed ahead, fast as she can go. Tries to get every ounce of speed he can get out of those engines uh, while ordering the entire ship pretty much to just get prepared for a, a rescue. Like, it's really amazing what Rostron had done in preparing Carpathia for what happened that night. R Rostron but, would eventually become the... Um... Oh dear, I'm going to say the wrong term. Not Admiral of the uh, Commodore of Cunard line, I believe. Uh, he he would get high. He would become a high rank in the Cunard line, uh, to say the least. Uh, many commendations would be to him for his night, for what he would do that night. So I saw one um, question in the chat, which is about what when would passengers know soon what, when the ship was in danger. Um, that's going to be happening quite soon. There's going to be passengers coming out on deck uh, rather shortly because the lifeboats are being prepared right now and swung out. We're, you can see that we're slowly zooming in as the ship's lifeboats are being swung out from these Welland type davits. And the crew, some crew who have never um, had proper training on how to work these davits, these are quote unquote brand new davits for a ship, usually they're radial type davits on ships. If you've seen Lusitania, Mauritania, and Carpathia herself, they're they look like cranes that are just um, somewhat like a tube. Titanic had Welland davits, a, a new type which could hold extra davits, or excuse me, it could hold yeah. extra lifeboats. Um, that's quick, controversial, but 
-hmm. A quick note on the Davids is, uh, we, and we could talk about this in more detail later, because uh, there's a big section of my notes about it, uh, about how these came to be. But the Davids on Titanic were essentially new uh, to the Olympic class in general. Um, they the, the very 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 short version is that they were expecting at any point within the next few years of the construction of these ships that the regulations for the minimum number of lifeboats might change and that they might need to be able to put more boats on these ships and so they kind of tried to get ahead of the curve by having the well and design these new davits to hold uh, an extra set of boats inboard of the main lifeboats and even though they have these davits installed they decided to not add the extra boats uh, again we'll talk we can talk about this later uh, you know, when the sinking's over but it, it was a relatively new type of uh it was a new type of davit for this and uh, it, it, it's it, it was done with that foresight of, the, it, of a potential right for, there's uh, best intention i mean the ship is a modern ship and you want in they Harlan and Wolf, the designers, uh, wish to use the most technologically advanced um, equipment on board this vessel, and that's why they picked the Welland Davits instead of the old school um, radial type Davit. I am saying the correct term, radial Davit, Kyle, is that right? Um, Lusitania had a lot of problems, I believe, if you watched any of the other amazing real time sinkings of Lusitania uh, with her lifeboats, including. Um, sorry, I saw your hand raised, Kyle, and it thoroughly told me, threw, me, threw me for a loop. Go ahead and speak. Uh, what's the current time? Uh, oh, 12.34, I see it on the thing. Okay. Oh, thereabouts. Yeah. So, you know, by, by this point, we had a few housekeeping things to do in terms of events. There's a lot going on in Titanic. I can't believe how fast it oh, goes yeah. by every, every single time. We, we, every single we had to play catch-up. Yeah, and uh, so, so, you know, around this uh, around this time in the lounge, apparently, first class passenger Edith Rosenbaum had been told by someone that Titanic is entirely unsinkable, and then a deck officer came in and you know called out women and children, kindly proceed to the boat deck and women and children only. Edith Rosenbaum. And she's my favorite. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. And you know, stewards and stewardesses from all classes, they were ordered to go around the ship. And just knock on doors, try to get people, hey, get your warm clothes on, get up on deck. So yes, yeah, to answer the question in the chat down. earlier, um, yeah, now is the time when passengers are starting to be aroused that there is a problem with the ship. Yeah. Potentially a problem. They're not being told exactly what's happened, however. Yeah. And uh, you know, Andrews himself, you know, he was rushing to and fro, and you know, he was trying to assist the passengers in getting ready. You know, he, he's putting in his own energy for this. You know, he encouraged stewardesses to put on their life belts and put on a good example. It wasn't just made up for the movie. Uh, it's actually, a side note, it's actually kind of amazing when you look into it how many little random bits in the 97 movie actually are based on real things. That's always interesting. Even the thing with the door being broken down and white Starline property. Um, in third class, you know, the, the evacuation was a bit more crazy like, there were passengers you know, chased out of their quarters uh, far forward by the water literally just coming in and they're running from it it's a scary yeah, situation uh, others, down there in the forward section of the ship yeah you know, others had no idea where to go you know some went up some went aft in the third class smoke room aft under the poop deck uh, apparently there were some passengers who were gathered around and quote a group of Italians arrived with their belongings and they were quote acting crazy crying and jumping unquote and you know, with the language barrier and the uh well frankly racism of the time you know this weird kind of racism that they had you gotta love it, that it, it, I, that racism if you're not just a, a protestant anglo-saxon you're you're anything but exactly anyway yeah yeah it's uh yeah, it was a factor here in the sinking, and yeah, it was this. There was this derision of Italians or people perceived to be Italians, which often just meant people with darker skin, even yes. if they weren't Italian. I'm Italian. But, so yeah, I can we, say these things. Some of these people, some of these people were, you know, they were openly mocked uh, by passengers and even some of the crew present. And you know, the crew apparently had you know, some even supposedly forced 
some of these, Ita quote, Italians out of their life belts, and when they refuse to take them off, you know... Oh, I didn't they, hear that one. Just, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to read that later. Oh, yeah, it, it's, uh... The short version is, it wasn't all well and good for some people in third class. Like, uh, it was, there were some real jerks among the crew, that's, that's for sure. There, is, yes, if there is a documentary, um... One of the very first documentaries I ever watched, um, called Death of a Dream, and I believe that the historian um, who gave this quote um, has passed away now. Um, however, he called um, he called stewards in third class who were not necessarily some of the best stewards who tried to help their passengers to the boats. Um, they each had a little Hitler syndrome. He called it where they were doing their duty, but they were going to do their duty beyond what was necessary and, and, and became a, a, a little Napoleon or a little Hitler. Um, and that was, is that his name, Brian? Brian Tricehurst? Yes, I believe he's, I, I do, I think he, I heard he passed away, unfortunately. Um, I could, if I just said he passed away, he didn't, I very apologize. He was great in that documentary, Titanic, Death of a Dream got me interested in Titanic right away. Yes, he's passed away. Thank you, David. That's important. Um, may he rest in peace. But yes, um, that stuck with me too, indeed. So there are indeed some stories of crew members and stewards trying to help third class, but there are just a bunch who shut doors and didn't help them at all. Uh, let's see. Uh, by this point, also, you know, fifth officer Low, he was helping get people into lifeboats. There's lifeboat Low six the... stuck in its position yeah. now, where it will be for I think like an hour or so, where it, it's, they discover that they can't open those windows on a deck because they forgot about them completely, and it's just going to hang there for a while. Famous lifeboat six. So yes. Or four? Was it four? I'm, I apologize, everybody. I don't know anything about Titanic. I it's okay. I don't know what I'm doing I don't here. I don't know anything. <laughs> uh, this is actually Lusitania sinking in front of us. It's 12:40 by. It's 12:40. So yeah, it's 12:40. I was. Oh, we got I, some catching up to do. Light teller was lowered lifeboat four. He was moving lifeboat six. That's why I said six. He was moving the six. Okay. Let's try, right. let's try to catch so, up. I don't know if we even let, can't catch let's, up. Let's try to let's try to catch up. I will try to go into fast mode here, which is basically just slightly faster. So, uh, right, okay. So, you know, by twelve thirty, of course, you know, we're ten minutes behind here. You know, the people are starting to trickle into the lifeboats, and you know, it was around this time, around twelve thirty to twelve forty, that um, Ida and Isidore Strauss were, you know, they were to kind of. Ida was supposed to get on a boat. She was like, no, I will not be separated from my husband. As we have lived, so will we die together. And then somebody suggested Isidore could get on, and he said, no, I do not wish any distinction in my favor, which is not granted to others. So he and uh, Ida, they stayed on deck. You know, they took some deck chairs, and they just kind of hung around on the ship until, until the, the end. end. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's... So, yeah, it, it, it's, you know, by 1240, Lytall area, he had decided to move boat six and prepare that for lowering instead of boat four, which was stuck. And, you know, on the starboard side, Murdoch was working on loading boat number seven. We got seven coming and, down now at this point, um, 110 years ago right now. It's making its journey <laughs> down, the first boat from Titanic, like boat seven. Filled to the brim Andy. with a, a grand total of, uh, uh, I have it written down. I remember it's it's supposed to hold 65 passengers that lifeboat, but it's only holding around 20 something passengers, I believe. In yeah, and Murdoch, yeah, Murdoch had trouble loading the boat, and he apparently Sorry, passengers 30, 30, thought it was 34, just... 34 passengers in in boat seven. It's half full. And apparently. Apparently, passengers just kind of thought it was kind of a joke. Uh, yeah, you know, just so there's just a mixture of uh, a smattering of men and women loaded in. 
uh, Stuart Henry Etches it's, was it's helping mostly, Yeah, it's mostly seven. first class passengers in, in these first lifeboats. Again, because they have the proximity of being, they have lifeboats in yeah. their on their their boat deck. And you know, it was around. It was in loading boat seven that apparently Henry Etches had noticed uh, Benjamin Guggenheim and his valet Victor Jiglio around, and they were dressed in their evening wear. And uh, <laughs> yeah, Etches asked what this is up, and. Yeah, this is where he had said, we've dressed in our best and are prepared to go down as gentlemen. Did that just really and... say what's up? Mm -hmm. but, uh... <laughs> Sorry. You know, G G Guggenheim had supposedly told Etches, you know, if anything should happen to me, tell my wife, New York, that I've done my best in doing my duty. And you know, I'm, always, I'm always a little bit dubious about these quotes because, y yeah, I'm almost certain these things aren't <laughs> exact words. Uh, at all, or if they even happen, you, you always have to wonder. But uh, it seems like a very Guggenheim thing to do, so you, you just it, never it know. It does seem like a Guggenheim thing. There were a couple of super chats that um, I do want to address. That I, I'm sorry, uh, there, oh, just because um, there was one from Historic Travels again. Hello again. It was great to have you in the last stream, and it's good to have you again for this one. Thank you. And whoops. Um, oh, I clicked the wrong button. Now I have a different chat. And our, and our good friend Albidam, um, thank you again for another um, super chat. Th that's amazing. Um, very much appreciated. Um, it's 12:44. Kyle, just keeping you up. Yeah, um, with with the time of Titanic. I see we're zooming in on some doors right now. So, are, have we caught up? Because I see a door opening in a second. Yeah, we are about to catch up right now. So. You know, apparently there had, uh, you know, I wanted to continue on the Guggenheim point because it's Please. real real quick because it's it's almost funny the way he, he, he dresses up in his evening wear and he gives this final message to his wife through etches, but then like apparently Guggenheim had uh, stopped another steward at some point and he said something very similar. You know that, that I had that he had played the game straight to the end. That no woman was left on board this ship because Ben Guggenheim was a coward. Oh, I did hear and that. He did say this. Yes. He, yes. He just went on and on, and it's <laughs> and then it, it, I, I had mentioned this uh, elsewhere, uh, uh, and it's I, I I don't even know what to make of it. Like he just goes around telling different people these things. <laughs> it's. You know, it's like, how many people, how many stewards did he stop to give his last words to? And you have to kind of wonder about that. And, you know, just hoping that one of them survives. And so, you know, we, we go back to the boats. You know, at, at boat five, uh, as that was being loaded, there was a man in a pajama robe and slippers. And he had started encouraging Third Officer Pittman to get women and children into the boats. There was no time to lose. And... Uh, Pittman had dismissed him and then realized later that it was mm -hmm. it must have been Bruce Ismay. Yep. <laughs> and so Ismay's just wandering around kind of in a panic, just wanting people to get in the boats. And uh, yeah, so to, to skip a little bit, we're yeah, by 1245, this is around the time that Lightoller decided that, hey, I know what I'll do. I'll send some guys down and open the shell doors on D-Deck so that we can bring the lifeboats up and uh, maybe load some passengers in there. So, Light Tolly sends uh, boats Wayne, Alfred, Nichols, and six other men down there to complete the task. Why you need six, I have no idea. They're, they're big, heavy doors. So, And it, it seems that the doors had been opened up, at least one of them, uh, as we see on the wreck. You better jump ahead uh, to where we are standing right now, because there's a lot of... I mean, we should talk about what's happening on screen right now. Lifeboat 5 just had a little bit of a problem being lowered. Um, as it was low, as you can see right here, as it's being lowered, there was too much rope let out on one side, and the boat tipped into an extreme angle. And it's going to hang there for a few moments until it's leveled out. Um, luckily, you have third officer Pittman in the boat, and he was he was there to blow his... Oh, and here goes a rocket. Here's the first rocket being launched from the bridge, and it's going to explode above in hopes to attract the titillatingly close lights on the horizon, which is Californian. 
this is at the time right now it is um, 12:47. This is the first rocket. So let's let's we, we we need to just jump ahead and try to catch up, Kyle. Unfortunately, there's so many things we oh, talked about Titanic. Yeah, but, but there's one. Yeah, there's uh, one funny thing though, which is apparently before uh, Bolt Five had launched, uh, there was uh, the Fruenthal brothers had believed that there was a problem with the ship's machinery and that they might be blowing up, so they decided to jump into the boat. <laughs> Yeah, that was the whole thing. I do remember that story, yeah. So. But let's talk about so, these, these rockets, because it's 1247 right now, um, on the time of Titanic. Actually, it's 1248. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so Titanic had a box of distress rockets, um, just around 48 or so, and there was a fitting on the bridge, somewhere on the bridge wing or so, where they could launch them from. And it was, yeah, 1247 when the first rocket went up, uh, launched by 4th Officer Boxall. And over the course of the night, after this point, there were probably eight or so rockets that were fired, roughly every five minutes. Uh, the last rocket was fired at 1.50 a.m., about half an hour before the final plunge. And, you know, there's a lot of debate about the uh, color of the rockets and what they meant. You know, the, from what we know, Titanic's rockets were white. Um, Maybe. Yeah, but uh, according, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe. We don't know for sure. A lot of passengers said they saw colors in the in the rockets that night. Yeah. We will. We do have yeah. to say that to the to a degree. Even though California, Cal, the pat the crew on California did say they saw rockets and they saw white rockets. And you can see California's yeah. lights um, on the horizon right there in the animation. Yeah, and you know the thing is, according to regulations, the distress rockets were just defined as rockets of any color or description fired one at a time at short intervals so it didn't matter if they were white or colored and uh, there was i think yeah to, to it, quote um lawrence beasley rockets at sea meant just one thing and one thing only it meant the stress that they were in danger it didn't mean anything else besides company signals it didn't mean celebration it didn't mean it just meant get my attention I need some help. I need assistance. And yeah. Car Calif I almost I almost combined Carpathia and California, but Californian saw the the rockets, and that's where a lot of um, people today who research Titanic, um, that's why they hold the crew, and specifically Captain Lord of Californian, somewhat guilty for uh, the lives of the 1,500 passengers of Titanic. So we might want to talk a little bit more about that ship on the horizon, Californian. Um, earlier, a light. This is the light of the Leyland liner, Californian. Um, aboard the Californian, the ship had stopped for the night because of the ice field. This is the same ice field that Titanic was sailing into. They saw the ice earlier. They were, have been in the ice, and Captain Stanley Lord decided not to test the bergs during the night. He was going to wait until morning when he had daylight to sail around those icebergs. Um, captain of the ship decided that at this point, once the engines had stopped, the ship was not going to move. He was going to just take a nap in the chart room. These these were men who you were on your shift, and then to quote, I believe, um, maybe light teller or low, once you're done with your shift you're dead you go to sleep you need your rest because you're going to be up and working again for the next ship and as in the night we're on Californian's crew commented on how strange this mystery liner looked which the mystery liner was Titanic that she looked queer with one end out of the water and indeed that's the ship listing to the bow with the lights disappearing slowly into the water but they can't see that close because they're how many miles away um, is Titanic from California? Is I think that's debated hotly to this day. I think it's I, I think it's very hotly debated. And in, in fact, there was a recent article, I believe, in the uh, in an issue of Voyage for the TIS about this. And uh, there's a theory that the ship on the horizon wasn't even the Californian or, or the Californian wasn't even seeing Titanic. That's a whole can of worms. Well, unfortunately, we're never going to know. Yeah, there's there's some things about Titanic we'll never 
actually be able to solidify and say give the final word on as much as we are able to kaboom as much as we're able to um research as possibly i want to say thank you guys for the super chats again jdp upstairs green i'm glad you enjoyed the plan and two second music player um i might want to invite david to say a few words um, david's another researcher on the team um historian uh, he's published in the Titanic Commutator, and he is here joining us, and it's 12.53 a.m., and I think he's going to say a couple of things about rockets. You can say whatever you want, David, by the way, um, and introduce yourself, because I think this is the first stream you've, <laughs> you've joined us for. This is the first stream that I've, I've joined you. Thumbnail from the Pigeon Forge video. Oh, yeah, you're a little... I... You're a little you're yes. a little weird sounding. I have to. I might have to. Okay. Hang on. You're a little robotic uh, at the moment. Is this any better? Oh. Uh. Let me. That's. He sounds a little robotic. I think his wireless is off. We'll 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 check back in with David. We'll try to get the Marconi to work. After technology, folks. Technology. Never works. He's gonna fix himself. I've I've met him before in person. He's not a robot. Trust me. Okay, it, it's just it's just time dilation. It's, and yes. Just on a different plane. Yeah. So the let's uh, while David fix himself, I'm, he'll definitely have some input that's worth um, waiting for. Trust me. Um, so, and and now he'll forever be known as the THG cyborg unfortunately um, so and we can say arigato to him uh, yes sorry for that uh, sorry I'm not making fun of you David I just have to roll the punches when these things happen um, he needs an oil change yeah um, thank you guys again for um, super chats and being here as we're remembering Titanic's 110th sinking anniversary um i suppose it's it's always odd to say that we're here together se quote unquote celebrating or uh, remembering a disaster but we are um it's 12:55 a.m titanic time we are titanic is in her own time zone that's why it does not sync perfectly with what time zone you're in regardless of what part of the world you're in the minutes are off by two minutes um, it's 110 years ago that this is a live event and that's why it's slightly off um, we're going to keep focusing on the sinking a little bit as right now we are looking at lifeboats two and oh wait um nope that's one and three i i know titanic i swear i know titanic that's one and three and they're filling up we're going to have some things to talk about, a lot of things to happen, um, once it hits the hour mark. Um, because things are just going to keep going and fly by. Um, the very first SOS is going to come up, quote unquote, the very first SOS in history, is probably going out right now. So you can, I don't want to say put those SOSs in the chat because you all are going to get timed out by YouTube doing it, but it was <laughs> just before 1 a.m. Um, when the first SOS happened. Does anyone want to talk about that? Ben, do you? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. Oh, or um, you want to talk so about something else? You can. Just said just before 1 a.m. on... Um, just before uh, 1 a.m. on the morning of April 15th, um, Jack Phillips was tapping out his CQD, as we all mentioned earlier with the closest ship to be responding, which was the q and liner, Carpathia, where, as his junior operator turned to him gently and said, uh, Harold Bryce said to him, why don't you try using um, SOS instead of CQD? It's the new call, and it may just be your last chance to send it. And this drew a laugh from Phillips. But why not? He must have thought. And he began tapping out SOS at, at 12.57 a.m. So those dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, 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 and apparently it's meant to be the first time in history that SOS was used famously in the sinking of a luxury liner of big ships like this. So there it is. It's literally just going into the time now, and 
that would be it, 110 years ago it being sent out. As Matt's already said, though, quite a few things are going to be coming up over the next few minutes. After one o'clock, we've got a lot of things happening with Quartermaster Row, Officer Boxall, all over the place. Lawrence Beasley, I'm going to leave that up to others to talk about, but a lot of things are happening very quickly with this ship because it's a large ship and a lot of things to be talking about. Yeah, there's. I mean, this is yeah. this is Titanic. I mean, we're talking about this ship 110 years later after the fact. Um, not just because it's saying, but because this is a oh, there's a lot happening on this most famous ship wreck, most famous ship in history, because there's enough time to do so, enough time for drama to have g played out while this disaster unfolded. Um, we we are fortunate, quote unquote, fortunate. I'm gonna be I'm going to be quoting myself a lot, to have had these stories given to us, to be able to keep them and remember them, to know how fascinating this tale was. Um, I apologize for quoting Leonardo DiCaprio here, but when he was being interviewed for the behind-the-scenes featurette for Titanic, <laughs> he said that the, the history of Titanic was like a like the like the perfect story out of the Bible, but it you know, it's 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 got that much um, drama and intrigue. It's got great characters, and it's all real life history proven, written word, and you have evidence for it all. So it's all it's all true. It's all it's it's a real life story that's incredible. Um, so you know, it's been 110 years, and in another 10 years, people are going to be talking about it, and. And then in, in one, another hundred years, people are still going to be fascinated with Titanic. It's probably going to be even more fascinating, uh, more intriguing once the ship has finally collapsed in on itself down there, and there's not much left. We we have no more survivors with us yet. We're still talking about her her story. Now I believe. Well, that's not technically true, Matt, is it? Because one of the the last survivor of the wreck is the, of the sinking is the wreck itself, that's, and so yes. whilst we've still got the wreck down there, it's still worth there's still learning as much mm -hmm. as we've got from it. There's still stories that she can tell us uh, if we're willing to listen, and um, we all mm. should keep a, open, our ears open and our our minds even wider for what she can tell us. Now it's 1 a.m. Um, Titanic time. Uh, as these boats continue to load, um, and more drama will play out as as the... well, as soon there's going to be some more um, intense flooding. I believe uh, we're going to try David one more time. Well, not one more time, but we're going to try David. Let's see if David's here. Are you here, David? Uh, yes, can you hear me now? This is what you sounded like the last time I spoke with you. Yes. Oh, do I sound the same to you? Do I sound okay to everybody else? <laughs> you sound great. I hope so. Yes, I think you sound good. Yes, David, you sound great. Yeah. Okay, I switched my microphone, so that's what it was. Uh, thank you for having me here. Oh, um, of course. I, 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 this is... Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. Never thought, never thought that I would be on a broadcast. But uh, I had a couple of things about the distress rockets because uh, I've been doing some looking into the Californian recently, and I found uh, in Leslie Reed's book, "The Ship That Stood Still," they have a definition of the rockets here from the Merchant Shipping Act of 1894, and in the section about private sig signals. It says that a company can basically register to have a specific signal that is they can use uh, to identify themselves, but the board may refuse to register any signals which cannot easily be distinguished from distress signals. And they said that if they are used in any other place for any other purpose, they might be signals of distress and you should uh, investigate. So, so that kind of, uh, I don't know, it makes uh, the ca Captain Lo I guess that's why he kept asking Officer Stone, but if 
the signal did the way that I've read about the description of company signals is that they're very, very specific. Like White Star is two green flashes, I think, or one green flash followed by a rocket. They're meant to look different from just a normal rocket. It'd be a specific type of signal instead of just a one flash yes. or something. You you try to like show that you're specifically sending out a code essentially and yes. right here they were just trying to get the attention in general they were also using their morse lamp on titanic titanic had two rather powerful morse lamps on her bridge wing cabs which we will see uh, again later on once we pan around um, and they were flashing morse signals again um, basically the dots and dashes um, in the form of light going on and off to signal Californian. Um, but in Californian couldn't read Titanic and Titanic couldn't read Californian. They were, they were attempting to be there's, you can barely see the Morse lamp right there in the, in the, towards the top left corner. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's, they were still too far apart from each other. There's still too much distance. Um, you know, there's a lot of mis obviously miscommunication no communication um it's it's tough to place blame on anybody 110 years after oh, the fact yeah. but back then it was much easier and they somewhat needed a, a escape a scapegoat now i want to thanks david for all that is that what you um published in um the commutator i'm just i know uh, that uh the commutator article was about uh the new york times interview with harold bride okay i knew it was uh, i knew was... it was some sort of communication i apologize i thought i wasn't sure if it was <laughs> all... morse communication or uh or, or or rocket communication so thank you for letting me know no i just oh, started looking into that uh oh thank you uh and i i just started looking into californian recently and have been spending way too much time reading about it um yeah i i think it's debatable as to whether or not lord could have the californian could have actually made it there in time that's to that's make that's how i feel too. Any i don't know i don't think yeah. that they would have been able to get those engines remember californian is the life is the ship that's way off on the horizon and depending mm -hmm. on how far away she is her her engines are turned off and cold you have to get the ship running and started 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 up and it will take a long time to get there, and by that time, well, Titanic had had already submerged, and those passengers had been in the water, and then you're going to have to get them out of the water. It, it would have been an ordeal, and rather, yeah, you might may, could she have saved a couple of more lives? That's all that would have mattered, though. Um, let's jump back into the timeline that we're going, that we're following, um, that we're just talking. Literally, Kyle's notes. Um, it's after one o'clock. We have more boats, which are loading up right here we're looking at lifeboat number one lifeboat number one has a little bit of an interesting story behind it uh, well rather all lifeboats do but lifeboat number one there's the, the the duff gordons are going to get into this lifeboat with their secretary laura francatelli um they're standing waiting the ladies do not want to part with sir cosmo um however after Lifeboat number three, which is immediately aft of lifeboat number one, has lowered, which it has done. It's gone now. You can see that there's no lifeboat aft of this one. Sir Cosmo asked the officer loading the boat if they could all get in, and he said, please do, the officer replied. So the Duff Gordon party all boarded the lifeboat. A couple more first-class passengers approached the lifeboat and asked if, he could, if they could get in, and Murdoch, first officer Murdoch, who was loading the lifeboat, um, told them to jump in. Um, this is... First class passenger, um, who is it? Charles Stengel, I believe. He, there's that large rail, that top, that rail right there. He had to climb over that rail and he rolled over the the cap, the cap rail. And it was kind of amusing to Murdoch. And at the time of the the events that are going on, it made Murdoch laugh a little bit. And the the role Murdoch found it amusing. He even said out loud to Stengel, "That's the funniest sight he had seen all night." Um, which is interesting because Murdoch, oh, there goes a, a rocket. I hope everyone's okay. Um, they're, they're loud rockets. Um, this lifeboat would hold only 12 passengers. Now, it's not as big of a lifeboat as 
the regular size life bolts. That's an emergency cutter. It's, it's supposed to be lowered um, in case of a passenger overboard or etc. It, it only holds 40. Um, so it's, of course, not filled, but it's still, it could hold more, and it's going to hold 12. So we've got some more um, flooding going on down below. We're not going to go down below, but that boiler room that we saw earlier in the stream, boiler room number 5, which Kyle had created when he snowballed Demo 401. Boiler number 5 was not damaged uh, as badly as the other compartments. Only a tiny bit of damage had been done by the Berg um, within the coal bunker. It was controllable by the pumps. The, the bunker itself is that's where the coal fire had been in. Um, it was apparently filled with seawater. But the boiler room itself was still dry. Now, however, at 110, this all ended. And we're, we're going to talk about that when that time happens. I forgot what time it was. <laughs> I'll be honest. I've been trying to read the notes and uh, look at the screen at the same time. Uh, Kyle left. I think he's going to come back. I'm not sure. About 108. It's 108. Thank you. We're almost there to the time where the flooding is going to intensify down in boiler number five. These are the port boats again. There's boat number four still stuck, quote unquote stuck, where it can't be um, filled with passengers because of the windows right there, the ADEX screen. Those windows which can be cranked down by hand. There's a, there's glass windows within those um, that screen right there. No one can find the crank. It's just a handle that um, can be portable and, and, and inserted in and cranked down. It cannot be. Oh wait, that's not Molly Brown's boat. That was that's boat eight that was launched. That's boat six right there. That's Molly Brown's boat. Margaret Tobin Brown is going to be into that boat right there. Boat eight yes, was lowered before. Uh, I swear I know uh, some things yes. about Titanic. I promise you. Boat six should be leaving at 1:10 a.m. Right, and that's an, that's any minute now. Yeah. To, to quote the movie, uh, excuse me, to quote the musical Titanic. It was any minute now. It was the uh, boat that was um, led by uh, Fleet, and he um, he was quoted as saying that after that night, he said that of all the boats that uh, Mrs. Brown could have got in, she got into mine because she was quite a handful for him after the boat was launched, and she basically took charge of the boat. Yeah, she was going to... She, she became famous after this night, and... And we all know her now as the instinctable Molly Brown, of course, back in 1912 and up until her death. She was known as Margaret um, Tobin Brown, which is what her name was. It wasn't until the, the musical, the instinctable Molly Brown, made her famous. And it is now 1.10 a.m. And that bunker, which is filled with water, which was filled up, but not flooding into the boiler in boiler number five. Uh, according to leading fireman Barrett, who was in boiler number five, suddenly there was a terrific rush of water which came flooding into the boiler room and towards Barrett and between the boilers. Yeah, Barrett was ordered up top by his superior, um, junior assistant engineer Herbert Harvey. So he climbed the escape ladders, the ladders that Kyle was talking about before. They're not trapped down there by the watertight doors. There are escape ladders which lead them up to the upper decks because the top of the compartments are not watertight. Barrett exited the boiler room via the door along Scotland Road on E-Deck where he saw the water flooding the forward end of that long corridor, that's that long open corridor on the port side of the ship known as Scotland Road that you can explore in, in Demo 401. And which is going to cause a lot of havoc for Titanic in, in just a little while. And there goes lifeboat number six. Lifeboat number six holds a lot of uh, distinguished um, first class ladies. Um, it's going to be discovered to have not enough crew member to man it, to man the lifeboat. There's going to be, um, as Ben said, Frederick Fleet, the lookout who saw the iceberg is in the boat, but also 
the quartermaster who was at the helm of the ship at the time of the iceberg impact, Quartermaster Hitchens, is going to be at the helm of the ship of this lifeboat as well. And they're going to discover halfway down that they might need a, another hand to help man the boats. And first class passenger Arthur Pushin is going to volunteer to go down the lifeline of the boat, which are invisible right here because they didn't actually exist. He's going to climb down the lifeline into the lifeboats. And as he falls into the lifeboats, his wallet is going to fall out and it's going to splash into the water. So if you remember the wonderful movie A Night to Remember, Molly Brown's going to call up and say, Hey, Sonny, got any extra men up there? Or she says something about that. So that's my, that's my Molly Brown impression right there. The time wonderful, is... Matt. Thank you very Excellent. much. I, I it's agree. worth quickly mentioning as well... It's worth quickly mentioning as well, Arthur Puchin was actually the only man that Lightholler actually let that's a good go point. from the ship. Um, he didn't let any of the men go. Um, but he only let him go because he was a yachtsman, and so to the, the boat, he let him go. He was the, the Canadian uh, yachtsman. He was the I, I, was he the president of the Canadian Yachtsman Association or something like that? The president, I believe. He was very... He had a lot of... Um, he had to prove himself, though, however, by climbing down the lifeline that hung over the boats. There's two additional lines which go down to the lifeboat. Not the lines with the davits where you can cut your hand and fall into the water if you're Robert Wagner in 1953's Titanic. But he had to climb down and and go himself. He, there, there was no way that Light Teller could lift, could bring the boat back up. So whoever was going to go down to help lifeboat number six, which is dangling there waiting for another crew member to go and join them, had to go by that rope by themselves. I want to see what time it is. Um, a couple of super chats really quickly. Just my two cents uh, by, by Ben. They were creating a lot of the dishes by um, the recipes in the in the books. Uh, they're very expensive. Co spent a, a good deal of time and money recreating several food dishes from the Titanic. And if anyone's interested in recipes or pictures, um, ask Ben Berlin for them because I've cooked. I haven't cooked the Titanic meal in a very long time. And I really wish I. I really wish I have. I've always wanted to, but I just can't find the time nor the money because indeed titanic's passengers ate well in first class and second class and by albie dam again is it possible that the open door helps speed up the sinking of titanic that door is still open and we will discuss it in a little bit and here we are it's 1 15 a.m uh we're walking along the deck it's empty here it wasn't totally empty yet it's going to be empty soon which is interesting. But here is the port promenade deck. Here are the windows which are impossible to open if you're the crew members for Titanic trying to get that lifeboat. Here's lifeboat six, excuse me, four. I know Titanic. Here's lifeboat four waiting for its passengers to board and the crew are trying to find a way to get anyone into that boat and find any way to get those windows down and eventually someone will find the hand crank. Now we're going to be able to take a little bit of a, a break and discuss more as we wait for other events to occur because there's going to be a little lull in the quote unquote titanic excitement as we pan out and watch the ship slowly settling to the port here. Um, but it is 1.15 a.m. By this point, only six lifeboats have departed the ship in the last hour and 35-odd minutes since the collision. Um, and there has been a rumor that has been circulating that men were l to be let into the lifeboats on the aft port quarter. And this is this is this is not going to be this is not going to be a good thing. The scene is going to become rather unruly. But as a result, the attention has been taken away by that to that lifeboat number four that's been dangled there. Fifth officer Lowe is going to have to run aft and assist at the port quarter. This is lifeboat number 14, lifeboat number 16. Oh, there goes a rocket, kaboom. There's, this is the lifeboat number 16. This is where there's going to be a, a growing scene of chaos. There's going to be a group of men who are going to try and rush some of the lifeboats there. 
Um, able-bodied seaman Joseph Skerritt had to use the lifeboat tiller to push them back at lifeboat 14. I think James Cameron's movie does this quite accurately. And so take a look at that scene from the movie and just imagine Lighteller with his gun. I don't know if I can say gun on YouTube anymore, but I'm going to shoot you all like dogs in that scene. Don't know about that part, if he had the gun unloaded or not, but the crew did have to go and get their revolvers. Um, was it Lowe who had his own pistol? His own private pistol, I believe? Um, I think it was Lowe. Yes, but... Um, let me read more of Kyle's wonderful notes while Kyle abandons me. Kyle is here now. Oh, good. Thank you, Kyle. We're talking about... What time are we on? Uh, I, I, I will believe... Well, I see the ship has not begun to list the port yet. 1.18 a.m., I see. Okay, good. Yeah, she's going to start soon. According to our animation, I don't know how accurate that is anymore. But yeah, we're, we're copying the um, wonderful... Um, well, we copied, in our animations, we've copied a lot... We've not copied as in ripped off, but we've tried to pay homage to a lot of great artists. And hopefully you can can notice their their works and our references and this is one of them but yes it's 118 a.m. and the ship is slowly starting to fall apart and right here I believe boats 14 16 and soon 12 are loading with passengers filling quickly because there's chaos back there the weather still is beautiful 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 cloudless star-filled nights. There's no moon, of course, but there's just millions of stars out there. There's millions of stars. It's cold. It's freezing. The air temperature is painfully chilly. It's It hurts your skin to just be out there. And there's a lack of vision, also. What you see here is not what you would have seen in real life, because we need to be able to show you what's actually occurring and back in 1912 there's a lack of any sort of illumination of course the same that has to be given in any movies any media otherwise you'd just be seeing a black screen you wouldn't be able to see probably 15 feet in front of you unless you're via light source so it's 1 20 a.m uh what's what's happening on the decks of titanic So, um, boat 14, um, boat 14, the scene starting to grow quite chaotic. A group of men tried to rush the boat. Uh, you've already said that. Um, that. Uh, boats 14, 16, soon 12 begin loading. Boat 14 has actually got stewardess Violet Jessup, who's just climbed in. Um, and then Officer Moody has handed her a baby. Now, Violet Jessup, if you know her sisters quite well, She's no stranger to the Olympic class liners. What a danger. Jessup was involved. She served on the Olympic Titanic sister ship and was on board during the Hawk collision. So that's when the Navy ship, the HMS Hawk, collided into, well, was actually pulled into the stern of the Olympic um, as she was leaving the Solent out of Southampton. Tonight, she finds herself on the Titanic on its maiden voyage as it's sinking. And luckily, she did get away. And then a few years later, in November of 1916, Jessup was serving on the Titanic's second sister ship, the Britannic, as a nurse when it was struck a mine and sank just off the Isle of Kay in Greece. Again, Jessup found herself escaping in a lifeboat, however, she nearly didn't make it this time because her lifeboat was launched too early and was pulled quickly towards Britannic's still turning propellers as they were rising out of the water. The boat and most of its passengers were dragged through the blades, chopping it to pieces, and Jessup and others managed to jump out in time. Though she was injured in the process, with a few light injuries to the head, well, I'll say light. With yet another extremely close shave, Violet Jessup managed to survive the disasters of all three Olympic class liners. Now, this lady was either very lucky or very unlucky. I'm going to leave that up to you to decide. Yeah, it depends how on your you perspective. Uh, lifeboat number. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, this woman, she was found herself in all three of the disasters that happened with all of the Olympic class liners, and she, she survived. She but, wasn't the she wasn't the only one, was she, in terms of people who were on the ships, like, people who were on multiple of these ships who uh, got into a bit of a disaster. 
as far as I know. I think she I was the only one who was on all three of the Olympic class liners, though. I think there was um, a couple of others who were on either one or the other, but weren't on all of them. Um, other things that happen at the moment, Lifeboat 9 has yet to be launched, uh, or loaded, sorry, and during part to a large crowd of men again. Now some crewmen are present to help control the crowd. Murdoch asked for women and children to be brought forward and loaded into the boat. Boat 14, a man tried to get in, and so this is the one back where Violet Jessup is, but was ordered out by an officer who also fired his gun in the air, shouting, Stand back, I say, stand back. The next man who puts his foot in the boat, I will shoot him down like a dog. So things are starting to get tense, things are panicking, and panic is really setting in at this point. Um, sorry, go on. What? I didn't hear it. Oh, no, please mute. Shut up, Matt. <laughs> Titanic, Titanic. Uh, oh, what's happening next? Second pass passenger. Uh, Dan, shush, Matt. The Titanic is sinking and you're going on about your toilet business. Um, Dagmar Brill and the other brother, Kurt, and her fiancé, Ivor, have made their way to the boat deck. <laughs> find themselves on, on, on a lifeboat, possibly 12. However, only Dagmar was allowed to board, holding onto their fiancé's hand, not willing to let go. An officer ran up and clubbed Ivar back, forcing them apart. And as the boat was lowered, she saw Ivor... It, I'm pronouncing this so wrong. I'm so sorry. Um, Ingvar and Kurt leaning over the rail, waving their hands, smiling, and she never saw them again. This is just one of so many things that happened in this short amount of time. Um, anyone else wants to jump in at this point and say anything else that's happening at this time, feel free, because I'm getting a bit tired of hearing my own voice. Um, uh, I'm looking here, and... Uh... Boat number 14 is about to leave with 5th Officer Lowe in charge. Uh, that happens in about a minute. Um, a few minutes ago, from what I'm reading here, most of the firemen and trimmers and greasers were released to go up to the boat deck. Thank goodness. I mean, that's one of the... Well, we'll discuss the engineers later on, but one of it, it's 1.25 a.m., everybody, but one of the myths about Titanic is that people are trapped inside the ship down below, and I, I, I'm I, glad that Kyle, from the get-go of tonight's stream, made it clear that the crew were not trapped down below once the, the watertight doors were slammed shut, nor were they forced down, ordered down below to continue powering the ship, putting coal in the ship's boilers. Uh, yeah, it, 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 despite that, though, like, like they, some crewmen did go down, um, you willingly. know, to draw the fires. More willingly. Yeah, willingly to draw that's, the fires. That's, that's, and, a, that's a big difference. Yeah, and, and, you know, they still had a job to do, even if it was just to shut the boilers down or... You get the fires drawn and all that. And even in the places where it was flooding, like if you guys had to go back down, you know, just make sure some stuff was done. And they, they, of course, there were people working in Boiler Room 5 to keep the pumps going, and, you know, early on anyway, and stuff like that. And so, you know, some of these guys, they had a job to do. So we're in the block of time around 120 to 135. And you have a lot of boats lowered around this time. You have lifeboat number nine. It was launched at 1.20 a.m. Uh, 65 capacity, and there were 56 aboard. And then you had lifeboat 12 that was launched at 1.25, and lifeboat 11 also launched at 1.25. And both of these had you know, the 42 and 70 aboard, respectively. And... Well, apparently when boat 11 reached the water there was a bit of a difficulty with a uh, release mechanism uh, and then it was kind of made a little bit worse by a nearby the condenser discharge and had nearly flooded the boat so you know they got on jammed and they did make it away safely kaboom sorry there goes a rocket so boat 11 is boat 11 the one in oh no boat 11 is on the other side boat one of the Boat 14 is the one that's going to get jammed. 
soon too on the port side if we're going to see it here in the animation um, it's going to be lowered in a couple of minutes too and boat 14 um, I'm reading my notes is launched with a good number of people on board 40 people on board uh, but it also has its falls or its hooking mechanism jammed and lows on board that boat and it's five it's hanging in the water because of the, the port list and it drops five feet into the water with passengers being a little frightened by that and most we'll, we'll see that shortly i believe it's actually lowering right no uh, that's 16 it's hard to tell from my titanic's a little bit smaller so i can't actually see So right now there's a lot of activity going on on the after decks of Titanic's boat deck where there are a lot of passengers uh, attempting to get into these last lifeboats. There's still a, uh, there's still a handful on the, at the bow of the ship. Uh, however, this is where passengers from the lower decks of the from third class have come up. Um, they were not. Let's let's talk briefly about third-class passengers and how they were able to get up from the lower decks to the upper decks. Um, because I, I said we were going to mention that. Now, one of the most famous and probably iconic scenes of any Titanic. It's it's 1:29 a.m. by the way, everyone. Iconic scenes of any Titanic movie are third-class passengers trapped behind a locked accordion style Bostwick gate and sorry to burst anyone's bubble who is just joining in to our stream uh, we've discussed this many times before there were very few of those gates inside of Titanic which would prevent passengers from going from one section of their ship their crew their class part to another part these gates were in actuality used for blocking off crew area, um, storage area, elevators, lifts. Uh, seldomly were they used to block off passengers from one part of their section to another because they're, the division between passengers inside the ship wasn't so much for the sake of the Gilded Age and dividing the classes but to prevent the, the mingling and spreading of any germs and viruses thanks for to the United States and their quarantine um, laws and those Bostwick gates are open and can allow passengers and airflow to happen readily now inside the ship where it's not necessary you'll you'd use an actual wooden solid door and that's what you'd have inside of Titanic where third class met first class and there's a wall a door would separate them a solid door, not a gate that would tantalizingly tease third class of what the area that they could not access looked like. There was nothing of the sort. So you wouldn't have a third class family with nine children trapped at a gate that's flooding, locked by a third class steward. You'd have waist high gates, you can see one right there that's blocking the B deck first class section that would light up from the well deck that's the type of gate that you would have separating third class from first class and these passengers in third class the reason why they were not able really to get to the lifeboats it's it's a really it's not easy to just explain in one live stream before we have to get to more um, topics that are happening right now. Uh, there's a myriad of reasons. There were stewards who I mentioned before wanted to help third class passengers. Uh, third class steward Hart, he led up groups of third class women and children to the lifeboats and that's how a lot of them were, were saved. Um, some didn't, a lot of the passengers were brought up to their compartments aft but didn't want to go up to the boat. Some tried to go on their own. Uh, there was a language barrier, there was just communication failure. There was a lot of failures that night, and it's one of the main reasons why you have a disaster. Now, moving on, we just had another rocket go off. Everyone's okay. Moving on, we are at—I missed the time by one second. 
We, <clears throat> we, uh, there, there, there's actually a one thing I, um, I wanted to bring up about <clears throat> Bolt 14. Let's go back to Bolt 14. Real quick, because that was launched at 1.30, uh, with a capacity of 65, 63 aboard. And, uh, that was the one, uh, 5th Officer Lowe, uh, he was aboard, and, uh, yeah, he, he was, uh, he, he was trying to, you know, keep the rowdy crowd away, and uh, they uh, they were wanting to jump into the boat, and Lowe had apparently described them as a uh, quote a lot of Italians and Latin people, uh, which are terms that they threw around a lot uh -oh. uh, back then. Yep, and uh, like like this prejudice was pretty. Yeah, it was pretty bad. Like to the point where when Lowe was testifying at the American Inquiry. He, you know, he said he had fired shots to prevent the Italian immigrants from jumping into the, uh, my lifeboat. Yeah, quoted, as saying, and uh, this apparently made the Italian ambassador so angry that Alo had to apologize in a letter. And uh, he, he basically, in the letter, he said, "I do, thereby, cancel the word Italian and substitute the words." immigrants belonging to Latin races. In fact, I did not mean to infer that they were especially Italians because I could only judge them from their general appearance and complexion, and therefore I only meant to imply that they were of the types of the Latin races. In any case, I did not intend to cast any reflection on the Italian nation." Unquote. And, uh, he got that little story from Lifeboat 14. PR control at its best. And yeah, so we get the we get, yeah the, the the gate situation was uh, it, it just it's nothing like what people uh, depicted it. It's yeah. nobody nobody was trapped by those kind of gates. Yeah, I mean it's it's a difficult situation on board. There there goes lifeboat. What is that? Which one is that? Ten that's being lowered right there. Um, ten, twelve, fourteen, six. Oh wait, I'm on the wrong side of the ship. That's nine. Yeah. That's that's <laughs> eleven. Eleven. 13, yeah, wait. 1, 2, 3. Here, uh, well, well, well uh, what time is it now? I don't know. I know Titanic, everybody. Yeah, we we, uh, we all know Titanic. Wait. Well, I'll let be real quick 15, to catch up. 15, 13, 11, that's 9. Okay. Yeah, yeah. about 9. Yeah. That's yeah. A, here, here, let's, it's it's, it's 1.35 a.m. So, yeah, we're, oh, we're going to just... Right. So, the, the drama yep. of boats 13 and 15 are going to occur soon. Oh, yeah. So, let's get caught up here. So... Uh, it, it was around 1.30 still uh, that this, this is where Stewart, John Stewart, fun name, checked the first class smoking room, and that's where he found Thomas Andrews. He was standing by the fireplace, you know, uh, staring at the uh, Plymouth Har Har Harbor painting by Norman Wilkinson. And, you know, his lifeboat was laying next to him. And uh, John Stewart, he, he asked, are, are you going to try for it, Mr. Andrews? And no answer. And of course, you know, we all. Norman Wilkinson was the one who supposedly invented the dazzle paint scheme uh, for ships during World War One. Up on deck, the loading of boats 14 and 15 was continuing, and uh, some crew had boarded, and both boats were lowered to A deck for the passengers to board there. And it was around this time, also, sometime after 1 30, that the third class passengers, Eugene Daly, Aggie Daly, and Bertha Mulhill, and made their way to the boat deck, and apparently on their way up, Eugene had nearly fought with a man uh, when he asked if they could have a life belt, because <laughs> the man initially thought that uh, Eugene was taking it for himself, but um, the guy gave it up when he realized it was for Maggie, and on their way to the upper decks, they exited the interior onto the aft well deck, and there they found many third-class passengers who had apparently been prevented from going up on the decks. Uh, being, they were forced to wait on the well deck until later in the sinking, and then the crewmen who were guarding the stairs up from the well deck, uh, they you know they opened the low gates and they finally let the passengers through. Uh, this is an important distinction because I mean, in a sense, there were gates stopping them from going up, but they were just these low exterior gates at the top of stairs or on deck divisions, and you could yeah, they they didn't. They weren't blocked for that long, and you could climb over them if you could. They were outside the ship, 
Yeah, they are the normal class divisions on the exterior decks. And apparently, uh, while on the boat deck, the daily group saw uh, a family named uh, Rice, the Rice family. They were standing to the side of the deck, and uh, you know, oh, yes. there was the uh, Margaret Rice and her five children. Uh, apparently, you know, the, it's unfortunately the entire Rice family. They ended up dying in the sinking. Uh, the Daly family, on the other hand, they got into boat 15. Uh, Eugene was forced to exit the lifeboat by an officer. Uh, but he later clamber onto one of the collapsible boats, and he survived that way. And the starboard list had reversed by this time as well, and the ship was listening to port again uh, more and more. Washington Dodge had uh, also wandered to the area of boats 13 and 15, and his family had already already left. And leading fireman Fred Barrett had made his way aft on A-deck when he arrived at boats 13 and 15. And... Uh, no officer was nearby at the time, and Barrett knew that the ship was going to sink. So he decided to just climb into boat 13, run with, along with several others. And also by that time, Lawrence Beasley boarded lifeboat 13 by jumping in uh, after there were apparently no women or children around the board. And then a man with his wife and child, he also rushed up to boat 13 as it was starting to be lowered. And apparently there's a story here of uh, Paul Mage, a kitchen clerk, and Chef Pierre Rousseau of the a la carte restaurant. They made their way to the boat deck, and they were... Oh, I know this story. Yeah, they were the lucky ones of the restaurant staff of, I believe it was 69. And uh, earlier they had been... These two guys had been prevented from leaving their quarters on E-deck by a bunch of stewards, supposedly. Is this and little, managed... little Hitler syndrome right there? But yeah, yeah, little little Hitler syndrome. The, the, supposedly the Alicart restaurant employees were just forced to stay below decks. Yeah, uh, you know, Italians quote, and the, these guys managed to convince the stewards to let them pass beca uh, because they were still in their uniforms, uh, but the rest of the staff were kept below, supposedly. Uh, Mars arrived at the edge of the deck by boat 13. He decided to jump in, and. Someone tried to pull him off the boat, but he managed to stay in the. He managed to stay in uh, somehow, and he tried shouting up to Rousseau to jump in as well, uh, but he apparently refused to do it. Supposedly because he was quote too fat, and he didn't want to take the risk. And yeah, these were t two of uh, three people to survive from the 69 restaurant staff. Uh, the rest died. The rest were the other people. The other um, from the staff were the, f the female employees, if I remember correctly. It's 1:40 a.m. by the way, Titanic time. And we so this is a. Oh gosh, we can see the forecastle deck just starting to come under water here. I hope uh, I'm not. In, in, and I just a uh, quick uh, disclaimer, everyone. FYI for those watching. Uh, this is still our OG. <laughs> animation from 2016 as we've focused on so many things over the years at Titanic Honor Glory the one thing that we haven't focused on is we have once we've tried recreating a, a different sinking animation at the end and we still aren't satisfied we're definitely not satisfied with that after we did it and we haven't changed this one either um, at all um, except for like some graphic things or filters. Kyle was going to um, open up Unreal and play with it, and we were going to switch windows. But I think we're not, I think we have abandoned that now because we're just we've got a we've got something going right now. And we're not going to change it. But yeah, this is still our original one. That's why if you see anything that's like glaringly obviously wrong, it's it's just it is what it is. It's just how we did it back when we did it. So I just want to throw that out there right now. So what's really interesting, Kyle? I'm sorry, I, didn't, I don't mean to interrupt you when I do. Well, uh, I haven't checked in the animation. Have boats 13 and, uh, has, uh, boat 13 launched yet? Um, I, I think it's on its way down, and we're gonna... Yes. Yeah, it's on its way down, and we're gonna go see it struggle in a little bit. Alright, uh, we'll come back to that. Yeah, according, according to the timeline, that should be happening in about a minute. Yeah. Kaboom. Mm. It's the last one still sitting there, ready to be swung out. 
it's not even ready yet to go, but it's still there, and ready, ready and waiting. And we know the drama that's going to unfold in that lifeboat. That like those two lifeboats. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Here we go. I think we're gonna go see that. Someone's just mentioned in the chat about uh, Chief Baker. Oh, sorry, go on. Oh, I think I think, it, I think that was all you, Ben. For a second. Oh, sorry. Um, someone just mentioned in the chat about uh, Chief Baker, uh, Charles Joffin, and um, about his part in the film. But um, he's just coming up in the notes down here. Uh, Chief Baker, Charles Joffin. Uh, he was on the boat deck at this time. I'm not sure if I've already mentioned him, but he was, um, as mentioned, Chief Baker for the Titanic. Um, he is. Um, he was known especially for uh, making patisseries and. Um, he made these lovely breads for uh, Mr. Andrews, Thomas Andrews, and um, but he's very famously known for supposedly surviving this night by um, consuming a considerable amount of alcohol, and especially for at the end he apparently stepped off the stern of the ship as it went, as he rode it under, but um, at this point he's currently on the boat deck helping women and children to the boats, and he helped um, get people to boat ten, mostly third class, and due to there not being many boats left forward and because 10 didn't even hadn't even been swung out yet this part of the deck was empty of passengers Joffin and some other crew had to go to the deck below and practically grab passengers and bring them up throwing them across the gap into the boat so there you are for that person who just mentioned Chief Baker Joffin that's what he's up to at the moment yeah he's doing the best he can he's going to be a, a hero there's many people who are trying to help passengers get into the lifeboats um, but speaking of lifeboats, we're gonna have a, we just have a situation here. Who wants to talk about this ordeal? I don't. <laughs> Step back. There's just too much going on. Hmm. Oh. All right. Well. Oh dear. No, mm -hmm. no, 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 no. I'm good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So, I gotta find it first. <laughs> on, Carl, you Come on. We all know what's happening here. We got lifeboat, <sighs> lifeboat 13. Yeah, life it's just launched. Yeah, Lifeboat 13 was just launched. It came down to the water. It's coming down. Mm -hmm. And there's this jet of water coming out of the side of the ship, uh, the condenser discharge. And it, when the Lifeboat 13 came down, it got pushed aft by the condenser discharge. At the same time, kind of almost getting a little bit swamped. And uh, as it got pushed aft... Lifeboat 15, which is coming down at the same time. It is 15, right? It's 15. 13 and 15. Right. Uh, 15 was coming down at the same time relatively quickly. And because the Lifeboat 13 got pushed back quite far, falls got really tight, and they couldn't just release them. So, yeah, they saw 15 coming down, and everyone was in a panic, and, you know, they... they we're struggling to uh, get 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 free, and uh, I know that Barrett had to get a knife from uh, another crew member or passenger. I, I forget, and they were struggling to cut the falls, and they're screaming, but they can't hear the the screaming on the top deck. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's uh, so yeah, you know, so f yeah, fifteen was descended, and uh, Mur Mur officers Murdoch and Moody were apparently busy elsewhere, so there was no one in authority to look after the lowering and to stop the boat from coming down so you know the, the boat 15 got low enough apparently for the passengers and 13 to touch so you know they pushed on it they pushed on the other side to try to move away and a couple and so yeah a couple of crew including fred barrett used knives to cut the fall and it, it, that finally freed them right at the last second before they got crushed and they managed to move out from under 15 and, and there you see that they're out of danger now and it was uh portrayed very dramatically in the uh cameron film in 97 yes. i remember that and seeing that and i didn't really when you read it it's one thing but when you see it it's a completely other different it is and i remember thanks gosh, for your feedback now i'm going to make it interesting i, I got to remember that quote too and i <laughs> and i remember going to the unveiling of the gravestone for um someone who was in lifeboat 13 who helped fred barrett cut the falls and my gosh i remember, wish i could remember the crew member's name but um his um his gravestone is in new jersey and i was with the titanic international society when they um unveiled a new gravestone he didn't have a grave marker for the longest time and they 
they were able to raise funds for him and get him one. And he was one of the other crew members who helped Fred Barrett cut the falls in that lifeboat. And I don't know if he had a knife or he gave a knife, but he helped to cut them with Fred. Um, and he was in boat 13. So, yeah. So there was a lot that was going on in uh, over on that on the starboard side of the ship. Um, and Titanic is going fast now. So, I... I always miss the time, and my clock is, my watch is definitely slow right here, so I think it is, did anyone catch the time? What time is it, everybody? I see, it looks like, um, it's about oh, 147. 147, thank you. It looks like we've launched a boat, to, okay, 148 right there. Boat, well, boat 4 isn't going anywhere, I know that much, but boat 2 has been lowered and is going to go on its little adventure around the ship. Okay, so we could probably run through about the uh, one. Okay. I literally just got it off. We could probably run oh, through sorry. the events the between... Robert J. Hopkins, the guy in New Jersey. Thank you. Oh. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Let's see. Okay, we could probably run between the events of uh, 140 to 150. But yeah, by this time the ship is going quite fast. It's going faster anyway. Uh, by this time, lifeboat 10 on the port side, it was still sitting on its chocks. Uh, it, it, it wasn't loaded, it wasn't even swung out yet. Uh, Murdoch was just now starting the process by 140. And uh, at Lifeboat 2, there was a group of uh, male crew members who rushed into it behind Wilde's back. And when, he, when Captain Smith noticed, he supposedly grabbed a megaphone and shouted, How many of the crew are in that boat? Get out of there! And they did as he asked. And then the women and children started boarding. And as loading of boat two finished, Smith turned to uh, Boxall and ordered him to get in the boat and take charge, which he did. And uh, you know, S Smith had apparently after that he looked to the water and he saw these boats out there and he shouted, you know, bring these boats back. They're only half filled. Uh, he blew a whistle. He called to a megaphone to Boxall, come around to the starboard side to the gangway doors, and Boxall began rowing aft to carry out Smith's order, although he, he never really did that. And in boat six, it was already in the water, of course. Quartermaster Hitchens had decided to ignore Smith's orders, uh, and he said, no, we're not going back to the boat. It is our lives now, not theirs. And instead, he wanted to row further away. He was in a very bad mood. Uh, supposedly, he was cowardly and almost crazy with fear. And you, know, you can imagine why, I suppose. Uh, by 145, the port list had increased, I mean, at least according to the notes, about 10 degrees. Uh, who really knows? Uh, we, we, but either way, this port list made the loading of boat 10 pretty difficult due to the about a two-and-a-half-foot gap between it and the deck. Around this time collapsible lifeboats C and D were starting to be prepared for launching and the boats were sitting on the deck inboards of boat 1 and 2 and it was Chief, ba Chief Baker Charles uh, Joffin or Jockin, I'm not sure really, uh, the, he was on the boat deck here still trying to help women and children in and it, it, getting into 10 mostly third class passengers and uh, due to there being so few passengers, so few boats left, and so few passengers out. That this is where this is the point where yeah, Jock and, and others, they were grabbing passengers to bring them up. So around 150, a steward had been serving. Supposedly, a steward had been serving free whiskey from mm -hmm. uh, the bar room under the poop deck, and you know, saying, "Go on, lads, drink up. She's going down." And Trevor Thomas Dillon and others uh, took him up on his offer, and uh, as they were heading up to the poop deck. Right now, I just got to throw out there that lifeboat four has finally touched the water and be, has been lowered. So, so you, uh, it's, it's it's after 150. So, what's that about lifeboat four after it's been in the water? And it's going to row aft and see some portholes. And passenger uh. MC, Emily Ryerson is going to see water rushing into these portholes into first class oh, yeah. rooms with lights on it's got it's got to be a terrifying sight to be rowing alongside this massive sinking ship looking into these portholes of these fabulous first class cabins and staterooms and seeing water swirling around the 
the, the ornate style of furniture. It's, it's, it's rather terrifying, actually. And looking up at this this hulk of a vessel still above you. And there was yeah. quite a bit of a uh, first class society in boat number four. Oh, yeah. That was the boat with the uh, boat. Mrs. Astor. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Widener, I believe, was in there. I believe Mrs. Thayer was also in there. I think and so, Mrs. yes. Mrs. Ryerson as well. Yes. That was the boat to be in. And that was 10 going down. I think. I think that was 10. So, yeah, we're getting into the... We're getting into the last moments of Titanic soon, everybody. I think I saw the chat saying, here we go. So, yeah, it's about 1.53 a.m. So... Uh, that oh yeah, we we have we have more info about Charles uh, Joffin here. Let's discuss the Baker, everyone's favorite character, oh, yeah. the Titanic everyone, drama series. Yeah, everyone loves the Baker. So this is sometime between 1:50 and 2 a.m. So yeah, by this point, forward well deck is just well awash, and the forecastle is going down. Um, and this is after the point where Ryerson had noticed the uh, ADEC portholes. And it was around this time that Chief Baker uh, Joffin was... He was down in his cabin sometime after 1.50. According to him, he was having a drop of liquor. A drop. And he briefly met and spoke with the ship surgeon, Dr. O'Loughlin. And that's when, he, that's when he noticed water starting to flood into his cabin uh, through an open and watertight door nearby. And when he left the cabin to go topside, he saw two men arriving to close the watertight door with a large spanner. 23 skidoo. Now, now, interestingly, the cabin in question was on the port side of uh, E-Deck aft, as far as we know, and that was near the reciprocating engine room. And this is interesting because it means that by 150, the water is really far inside the ship on E-Deck. It's reached the engine room this far aft, and... Uh, it's just it, it pretty much and it's just flooding fast and it's it's probably spilling into all the boiler rooms by this point or at least most of them uh oh and you know, uh, Joffin at this at point, point. Oh, Carl, I'm sorry to interrupt you there but it's worth us saying at this point this is the point where now um, the wireless range because of the water going into the engines the wireless range is now getting much much less so Carpathia and other ships around are not being able to hear Titanic as much, whereas Bride and Phillips are still up there trying to tap away. Um, Captain Smith's going to come in soon and just say, um, do, that's it, you've done all you can, you, you can abandon your post on an issue. Uh, carry on with uh, Chief Baker Joffin though, Char uh, Kyle. Thanks. <laughs> we all love Joffin. Uh, the, the best character in Titanic. And... Uh... He, he did, yeah, after he left his cabin, he headed up to a deck and he was throwing an, a, a, apparently about 50 deck chairs overboard to help those in the water. And then he went to a deck pantry for some water. Uh, he said water, it was probably more liquor. <laughs> in the lifeboats, you know, passengers could see the ship sinking lower and lower, and the starboard propeller was halfway out of the water. In the Marconi suite, sometime. Uh, I don't know, around two, before two, something like that. Uh, Captain Smith came and he told Phillips and Bride that uh, Titanic will not last very long. The engine rooms are taking water and the dynamos might not last much longer. Uh, the operators had noticed the wireless power growing weaker, of course. And I-150, uh, Titanic received a message from Baltic saying they were coming to help. And collapsible C and D were being loaded. Um, it was around this time that J. Bruce Ismay was standing near Collapsible C uh, and <laughs> yeah, it was pretty clear by now to him even that the ship would be gone soon uh, generally speaking this is pretty clear to most people I think power was getting weak and the forward decks were under and the, the angle was increasing if you were somebody who thought that the ship wasn't going to sink. Your mind was probably changing around this time. Exactly, yeah. I mean, before when past, it's just, it's 1.57 a.m., but I remember early on, uh, Jack there had, uh, had always been checking for the list of the ship with Milton Long, a friend he made early in the evening, and now at this point, after 
Jack unfortunately lost his parents in the crowd. His mother had just got off in lifeboat number four. We, this, David did, mentioned her, um, Marion Thayer. He's watching a David, I believe, um, as the ship is slowly going down with the ship enlisting. He's watching it with the as it's moving with the stars as he's checking the list of the ship, and he can tell that the angle is getting more and more extreme. So most passengers, I'd say right now, can tell the ship is in mortal danger versus before when no one could tell that the ship was in any sort of um, peril at all. So there's not many lifeboats left either. We're at the last lifeboats that would actually be lowered here at 1.58 a.m. I think we're, we see collapsible C. The davit is now being swung out to help lower it down the side of the ship. And this is where you just mentioned a second ago, Kyle. Um, Bruce Ismay is at this lifeboat. Um, trying to fill it up with whatever passengers are left, and there's going to be a lot of controversy around Lifeboat C and its final occupant, Mr. Bruce Ismay. I'm going to pan over and, and see that boat. And, and because of the portless, when this lifeboat is actually lowered with Bruce Ismay inside, if he is either ordered in, into that boat, or if he gets in on his own accord, uh, it's going to have a problem lowered, being lowered into the Atlantic because of the port list in just a moment. Uh, it's going to rub against the side of the hull and, and bump along the rivets, and the passengers in the boat are going to have to push against the hull of Titanic to get their boat to get lower down to the water below. It's going to be rather rough journey down for collapsible sea. It, it wasn't just a simple lowering for most of these lifeboats, as it turns out. Uh, it was an adventure for all survivors. And this will be the last lifeboat to be lowered from Titanic on the starboard side of the ship. But they did try to launch... They were going to try and put collapsible A in those uh, the davits there. In that forward the, set. That for, yeah, the forward set, because... I. Is it the forwardmost one that's still standing upright? It's the very, f very four David that's still upright. It's 2 a.m. Everybody on Titanic. Yes, it's the forward David. On both sides of the ship, I believe, or is it just the starboard side? I'm it, not sure if it's up on the port side. I'd have to look. Too. I'd have to look too. But yeah, that's uh, as James. As I, I don't know if it was James Cameron or, or Charles Pellegrino. Pellegrino. Uh, he said that the life, that the davit is cranked in as a testimony to uh, Murdoch trying to lower that lifeboat and launch it at the last minute as the ship is going down under him. Here's lifeboat D, collapsible D. This is we the final lifeboat that is lowered from Titanic. Um, a bit of drama, like indeed again. At, at this lifeboat, as with all lifeboats, it's going to be lowered in just a few moments, and the final moments for a Titanic are coming up, unfortunately. Um, it's 2.01 a.m. Um, Kyle, is there anything in your notes about collapsible... In, this t in 2 a.m. to 2.05, you want to discuss what's happening right now? I see some interesting notes that I think you want to talk about. Yeah, so 2 to 2.05, you know, the end is approaching at this point, obviously. And uh, so after separating from other crewmen, there are a couple of greasers named Thomas Ranger and Frederick Scott. You know, they see boat four in the water, and uh, they both uh, climb the dapits and slip down. Uh, one of uh, Scott lost his grip. He fell into the water. Ranger managed to climb down. Uh, Scott was pulled into the boat after Collapsible C was being loaded. Murdoch was having trouble finding women and children. Uh, Quartermaster Rowe got into the boat to help man it. And uh, it was around this time that Bruce Ismay and first class passenger William Carter. Uh, Carter was the owner of the Renault car in the hold. Uh, they climbed in. 
Uh, later on, four stowaways would come up from under the boat seas seats, and these were described as, quote, Chinamen or Filipinos. Uh, these were, of course, uh, four of the six Chinese survivors of the sinking. Uh, they were third-class passengers. As boat C was being lowered, it was uh, scraping along the hull during the uh, port list, and the sailors on the boat were trying to push against the hull to prevent the damage. And it was at this time that a, uh, a man named Sahid Nakid had uh, took the chance and jumped down into the boat. Some women helped to cover him up. And he just kind of laid there. And he wasn't noticed. Uh, I believe his family had already left the ship earlier. And he had been uh, rejected a place on a boat. Uh, apparently a gun was fired around this time as well to keep men back. And water was uh, creeping up the forward stairs uh, from the uh, bridge to B-deck. And collapsible D was, uh, of course, being loaded very hastily. And it was uh, Colonel uh, Gracie. He ran around the deck calling for any women or children because they just couldn't find anyone to board D. And at boat D, there were several uh, crew, including Quartermaster Bright, Second Officer Lightoller. They were ordered to man the boat. Lightoller. Uh, didn't want to do that. He said, not damned likely, and he jumped back on deck. Uh, instead, Lightoller asked uh, Chief Second Class Steward John Hardy to man the oars, and uh, Hardy got in. Around 2.02 a.m., uh, this is the, around for the last time Captain Smith visited the Marconi Suite, and he released uh, Jack Phillips and uh, Harold Bride from their duty. He... You know, he said that, you know, he, they've done their best and can do no more, and you better take care of yourselves, and then Smith left. Uh, but they they didn't leave. Phillips kept to his work, and he kept sending out messages. And uh, it wasn't long, though, before the power further failed, and uh, Phillips was no longer getting a spark. Or Phillips thought they weren't anyway, but Bride would, uh, yeah. Uh, he's... Bride would later recall a Phillips, quote, he was a brave man, and I learned to love him that night, and I suddenly felt a great reverence to see him standing there sticking to his work while everybody was raging about. I will never live to forget the work of Phillips for the last awful 15 minutes. And so by 2.05 a.m., the forecastle is entirely underwater, and within 15 minutes or so, Titanic's going to be gone. And around the time Bo D was being lowered, Captain Smith was seen on deck. He was uh, still giving orders uh, from a megaphone. Uh, a passenger, Frederick Hoyt, approached Smith. Uh, he had known Smith for about 15 years, uh, and he offered his sympathies. And Smith basically told him to just jump on and get in the boat, and they better do it soon. Hoyt took his advice. And he, he tried to, he did that. And his wife was already aboard Boat D. And uh, passengers Hugh Woolner and uh, Maritz Akan Bjornstrom, Stephenson, what a name, were also on A deck waiting for the boat. And when it reached water, the water, they both jumped in from the railing. Right about now, I guess, because there goes the boat into the water. It's lowered, the last lifeboat from Titanic. Yep. And uh, around 2.05 a.m., water began pouring over the bulwarks of uh, a deck, and uh, they qu it quickly flooded the area. You can see right there in the animation, it's, it's, uh, it would have been pouring in. And uh, oh, D detaches and begins pulling away. And uh, soon the bridge is going to start going under. And meanwhile, up on the boat deck, Light tollers focus on getting collapsible B off the roof of the officer's quarters. Now, two collapsibles on the roof are interesting. They're, you wonder, why are they on the roof? How do you get them down? I don't know why. I, I assume space. But the way you're supposedly going to let them get... Uh-oh. Uh, the, the way they supposedly would have gotten them down is to... There were these things on the... Uh, the guy wires and the funnels on the and ropes of the, you, the funnels yeah yeah you attach lines to them and you just raise the boats off the roof and lower them onto the deck but they just didn't have time or maybe they didn't know how to do this so they didn't bother with it they just 
shove them off the roof. And yeah. And when Collapsible D was launched, it had it had 44 aboard out of a capacity of 47. And Collapsible C, which was launched before that, had uh, 43 aboard uh, out of a 47 capacity. And now we're in the 205 to 215 block of time. Yeah, there's not much. Yeah, I want to say briefly what's going to happen before 215. Um, say it fast, because once 215 hits, I'm going to let the animation do its thing and keep us silent. What time is it now? I think it's like 2. 12-ish? 2.08, I'm sorry, it's 2.08 a.m. So All we right. don't we don't have much, Titanic doesn't have much time left, we don't have much time left. Yeah. Things, are keep, things are gonna get loud, too. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, by this point, people had started uh, apparently jumping off the ship in the stern, which was uh, gradually rising. Uh, Lytala was working with the crew to ready boat B. Moody and Murdoch tried to prepare boat A on the starboard side. The Marconi suite Phillips was uh, doing his, uh, so trying to send out his final messages. Uh, there was a, a stoker, apparently, who tried to take the, someone anyway, some crewman, tried to take the life belt literally off of Phillips' back. He, like, he didn't even notice. He was so engrossed in his work. And Bride, you know, he was a small guy. He ran at the stoker, and uh, he may have knocked him out with an object. I'm not sure. And it was, he got the life belt, and, and he, he and Phillips, uh, the, Phillips and Bride, they finally abandoned their efforts and they left uh, before it started flooding. Yeah, what what happened to the Stoker? Who knows? He, he probably died. And when they arrived out on deck, it was a chaotic scene. At this point, the band was still playing music somewhere nearby. And at this point, Phillips and Bride separated. And it was the last time that Bride saw Phillips alive. It was around around this time a uh, yeah around this time a uh, a big group of third class passengers arrived from below decks, probably via the grand staircase. No idea where they came from, but it was full of women and children. Even the crew were shocked at this. The crew working the lifeboats. Where did these people come from? Either side of the officers' quarters. Uh, the men were getting ready to shove the boats off the off the roof, and on the stern, you know, passengers from all classes and crew were uh, gathering on the deck, trying to stay on. Yeah, and this is around this time Father Thomas Biles and Father Joseph Parachutes were praying and granting absolutions to passengers on the poop deck, and by 2:10, uh, Thomas Andrews had left the smoke room apparently and he was seen probably around this time throwing deck chairs overboard still trying to help the passengers and uh, carrying a life belt to the bridge uh, a mess steward Cecil uh, Fitzpatrick he was crossing through the uh, the bridge at the time and he claimed to have seen Captain Smith talking to Andrews uh, with Smith saying we cannot stay any longer she is going and on the port side around 2.13 a.m. collapsible B was finally pushed over the side that landed upside down, and in the water that was starting to flood the deck. And uh, soon after, you know, on the starboard side, First Officer Murdoch, he ordered the davits to be cranked back in, uh, in preparation for collapsible A, but of course that never worked out. But the deck was still dry due to the list. The crewmen finally pushed the deck off, it crashed onto the deck, uh, Moody had wanted to let the boat simply float away, but he was overruled, and uh, the crewmen began to uh, connect lifeboat A to the falls. And, uh, you know, water began bubbling up from the forward stairwells at this point, uh, by about 2.15 or so. And Archibald Gracie, meanwhile, he was running aft on the deck, and he encountered a mass of humanity. They were kind of clamoring against the divider on the deck railing. And by 2.15, the boat deck, uh, which had already been submer submerging forward, suddenly took a slight but definite plunge. And a quick aside on Smith and Andrews is that 
We don't really know what happened to them, we'll never know, but it's unlikely that Andrews just stood around in the smoke room. He probably he's, he probably left to help people around that time. And uh, by now, you know, he very well could have been on the bridge. And Smith, whether or not he went down with the ship intentionally or jumped off or was washed off, who knows, but it, those seem like more likely possibilities than the more idealistic depictions of them. And now we're up to 2.15, at least in the notes. Uh, we don't necessarily have to yet. Uh, just keep being informed of the time. What is it now? The time on Titanic is probably... It's 2.13 a.m. ish. Roughly, I gotta. It's well. That's what time it is. Titanic time, synced exactly with our animation. Eh, give or take. This is when things get a little iffy with our animation. Our animation's old, but it is what it is. Yeah, we can always follow the animation. See what you know. We see what's on screen. It's around 2:13 now, and it's around this time that the boat deck is going under pretty fast. There was a point where deck just started going under even faster and a wave of water rushed across the deck the, uh, the, you know, it, 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 uh, the, the, the two collapsibles that were on the deck they got washed up and the one that was upside down kind of stayed upside down and it's it, people started running back it was this huge wave the, the boat deck just it's it's hard to say exactly yeah, it, it's hard to say exactly what happened. It just, it, the boat deck went under, the, the ship was flooding so fast at this point that it just went down. And people were getting washed off left and right as a wave of water came across the deck. <laughs> and it was, uh, when this wave of water washed over the deck, <clears throat> it... Uh, so many people got separated, and in some cases they died after that, or they never saw somebody that they were with ever again. And there are so many stories that I can't even repeat them right now.
Now indeed the most terrifying and awful thing for the survivors was the cries of those left aboard, but it was for some survivors it was the silence that followed after their cries ended because those 1500 people who were on board Titanic when she went under eventually they succumbed to the cold Atlantic waters that night so um, from 215 to 220 um, let's discuss what happened on Titanic a lot occurred and I'll bring back our guests if we wish to discuss Titanic's final moments in detail. Kyle, do you wish to come back and discuss what happens during Titanic's final moments for us? Yeah, I'll just have to uh, pull up the notes. So, yeah, that, thank you. Um, a lot occurs in the last five minutes of Titanic's um, final moments, of course. Um, so, we we can continue from the boat deck plunge, from the various stories that happened during this. Yes. One of them was uh, Gracie. He was caught by the wave, and he said he rode it, and until he caught hold of a railing, and he had been running around the decks with a passenger named Clinch Smith at that point, and he never saw saw uh, Clinch again. John Thayer and his friend, and his new friend Milton Long, they had been waiting on the boat deck this time to fight for an opportunity, opportunity to jump. Long apparently slid down the side of the hull, and Thayer jumped, and only Thayer survived. Uh, Scully and John Collins was helping a woman board collapsible A, and. Uh, holding one of her children in the process and when the wave hit him he lost the child and uh and they were gone uh, passenger alma paulson and her four children had been following some other passengers and when the plunge and the panic happened they got separated and all five of the paulsons died the uh, passenger george rhymes and his brother-in-law joseph loring they parted ways loring ran aft rhymes jumped overboard and loring was never seen again Near the gym, uh, Peter Daly, first class passenger, he, a woman stopped him and he, as he was about to jump, saying, oh, save me, save me. Good lady, save yourself. Only God can save you now. Still begging him, Daly took her by the arm and they both jumped as the wave was washing over the deck. And on the port side, passenger Henry Molson removed his shoes and uh, he was apparently going to try to swim for the mystery ship on the horizon. He had previously survived shipwrecks in 1899 and 1904, uh, but this time he was not so lucky. And as the wave moved aft, like this kind of thing happened again and again. Collapsible B was washed off, collapsible A was washed off, and it was around this time that uh, Charles uh, Charles Dolphin was still in the pantry getting his drink of water or liquor, who knows. And he heard a crash, as if something had buckled in the ship, or, or there was, like, parting iron. He was about right, he was in the ADEC pantry, about midships or so, yeah, right around the area where it would have kind of started to break apart. And uh, he also heard a rush of people on the deck above, so he went up on deck. He got caught in the mass of people running aft, and he eventually found himself on the aft decks, on the aft well deck, and then on the poop deck, and he switched his watch across pockets at this time, and he noted that the time was a quarter past 2 a.m. And, of course, as the bridge went under, Light Taller jumped into the water. Uh, he apparently wanted to swim to the crow's nest, and then he realized that it was attached to the ship, so that would be a dumb idea. He had an urge, just that was a refuge, a part of safety, but a, right, or something like that, yes. Yeah, so he... He turned around, but then he got forced to the uh, against the grating uh, in front of the number one funnel, uh, Stokehold, uh, number one Stokehold fan intake, as the water was pouring in, and he he couldn't get away. And then he got blown away 
as a, a rush of steam or air or something came up from below. And uh, yeah, Lightoller, as he kind of watched what was happening around him, he claimed that he saw a bunch of people sliding down the decks into piles and, you know, some definitely drowning. And it was around 2.16, 2.17 that the uh, funnels started to fall. The first two, anyway. Around 2.16 is when the first one fell. And the, the reason they fell, probably because they crumpled at the bases due to water pressure that was rising around them. And not so much the guy wires getting stressed or anything like that. When, it fe uh, when the first funnel fell, it pushed away collapsibles A and B. They kind of cleared them of the ship a little bit. And apparently, around this time, uh, passenger Richard Norris was swimming in the water, pretty close to the funnel, and his father was nearby. And he saw the funnel just fall on his father, just gone. And apparently, still belching smoke. And the ship's power was on the verge of failure, glowing a devilish red. And. Uh, of course, when the water reached the dome of the Grand Staircase, it's hard to say what was happening in there. My own opinion is that the Grand Staircase was already flooded pretty thoroughly by this point. I don't think there was ever an opportunity for a, a, a grand, if you will, uh, crash of water or anything coming in through the dome. When the ship got to its final angle... I'm, I'm sure we'll never know what the actual final angle was, but... It probably wasn't anywhere near what it was in the movie. I don't know if any of you want to talk about that. What was our angle that we had presented in our animation? Since you made the animation. I, oh, I don't remember that. Okay, just wondering. Probably something on the order of uh, 23 degrees, somewhere around there. It's just interesting how, depending on your perspective from... A lifeboat on the ship itself floating around it as a, a a bird's eye view it looks a lot more extreme from certain um, POVs um, I know that 23 degrees can look massive like a massive list it could look like 45 degrees depending on if you're low in the water looking up from perhaps Jack Thayer's perspective trying to get on board collapsible B. It can look like 45 degrees from a lifeboat. Um, two, if you're behind the propellers rowing away, I think it was lifeboat two. So it depends on your angle um, that your eyes are at looking from the ship. So, but indeed, uh, science somewhat tends to give us an idea that it's around 20, between 23 to max 30. I don't see how it could be 30, 30 degrees, but it proves that Titanic was a rather strong ship, though, indeed. But perspective is indeed everything uh, when, when it comes to what it would appear to from survivor accounts. That's all I could say about the final angle of the ship. Whatever the case... Uh, we, as we saw, Titanic stern was well in the air by 2:18 a.m. and it, and no matter how well the ship was designed, uh, this was a luxury liner that was never designed to be placed in stress of of that magnitude, and that's why it started to fall apart in a rather a rather messy breakup, indeed. Yeah, it it's. Hard to say exactly what happened during the breakup. I, I think there are two things in the world of Titanic that will get you murdered uh, in terms of opinions. Uh, one is your opinion on the color of the funnels, and two is how the ship broke apart. And yeah, was it a V break? Was it a whatever break? Uh, honestly, I don't know if it matters that much. We'll never know, and anything we go with is going to be. There's different bits of evidence for different things, and it just kind of, I don't think anyone will ever truly know. But the one thing we do know for sure is that the breakup wasn't clean. It, it may have started clean, uh, It's hard, regardless of which way it broke, but uh, very quickly, it quite literally, the middle section of the ship quite literally fell apart, or it got pulled apart. 
there's uh, yeah, initially probably broke in front of the third funnel and then it's it just kind of fell apart in the area after that the aft grand staircase obliterated um the uh, number one boiler room completely ripped apart along with this coal bunker the engine room uh, ripped in half and so many sections of the upper decks torn to pieces in giant chunks. Uh, whether these were ripped apart above the water as it was going down or below, it, uh, it's hard to say. And uh, either way, it's as it went down, as it broke apart, the ship broke effectively into, into not just the bow and stern, but the bow, the stern, and several large... Uh, towering sections of the superstructure and the hall and sort of the internal areas. Uh, for example, the third class, the area containing the third class galley was pretty much ripped out of the ship. And there were, there were even passengers, and Matt, you might be able to comment on this, like some of the we have a whole list of uh, passenger accounts of what they saw during the breakup, and uh, apparently some had claimed to have seen machinery and the engine cylinders kind of being pulled out of the ship as it broke apart. Man, literally thousands and pieces, millions, perhaps millions, fell out. I mean, we um, we we are stressing to build the ship first, but that doesn't mean we are not trying to research the breakup and sinking of Titanic as well. And thanks to our amazing researchers and our very um, lovely and generous historians that help us from time to time, we have gathered over, I would say, 130 accounts of the breakup. Some you have to take with a, a grain of salt, of course. Um, but there are not just testimonies, because there's very few testimonies. I think there's just over a dozen official testimony from the inquiries of saying the ship broke apart, but there are newspaper articles, um, accounts from passengers in correspondence between their loved ones and friends saying how the ship tore apart, and and they're always so telling, and they always describe it in a very similar fashion as rumbling, rattling, crashing, thundering noises or there's sparks and they can see what they were able to witness if they're in, in certain boats. We we're discussing how the millionaire's boat, boat four, with some of those first class ladies were so close because their boat left so late at 2.05, uh, at two, at, uh, just two o'clock, or one, one night, I already forget what time it was, but it left so late in the disaster, it was able to row alongside Titanic's hull it, and it was so close to the ship when she broke apart, it's the life that you see when the breakup animation occurs, that they saw the entire breakup, they heard the entire breakup, um, and they felt the breakup too. There's accounts of feeling the vibration of the ship shuddering apart into thousands of pieces. So indeed, we it's 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 terrifying to read these accounts of Titanic, not just sinking but breaking apart. And it, it was such an absolute mess. Again, when the ship broke apart, there was just so much steel and furnishings and pieces of furnishings and fittings and machinery and pumps, coal. Uh, there were two entire uh, coal bunkers that were just completely ob obliterated. Uh, the, 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 uh, huge, two huge sections of uh, the double bottom, which we all know about in the wreck, they split up and they took the, on top of them you had the the bunkers and boiler room one and part of the engine room and it was just kind of you know with those things kind of splitting up you have so much of the ship sitting on it and it's no surprise why so much of the section of the ship over those two double bottom pieces just fell apart at any rate you know, by 219, 220, the, the stern, it, it began to flood pretty quickly. It sank in the water with an ever-increasing angle. And I guess that's the third thing that'll get you murked in the Titanic community is whether or not it went vertical. 
uh, it supposedly it did like a, a corkscrew motion as it went down. Mm -hmm. and, it does and, seem like it uh, went vertical. That's why at the end of this animation, I, at the end of the redo animation that you did with passengers, I, I swapped in the old animation for the vertical <laughs> stern that we vertical did, stern vertical stern that we did in 2016. So yeah, from the accounts that I've read over those those hundreds that we have, we have a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet of accounts that have keywords such as. Uh, um, odd, like when they they mention uh, a sound or they mention a stern going one direction, etc. Uh, it does seem like it went that direction at the very end. And as the stern kind of went up, uh, Cecil Fitzpatrick had uh, watched uh, as the stern stank, uh, sank, and uh, he said that the propellers are well out of the water. And he described the final plunge as clean to dive as ever was made by a fish. And then it went down with a swish. And on the decks, the passengers were clinging to the decks and the fittings they, as if they were bees. And uh, it's, everyone seems to generally agree that this, regardless of how exactly the stern went down, it kind of bobbed there for you know maybe a, a few moments or a minute or something as it kind of started to flood. And... Uh, this isn't really unusual. Like, we've... I think it's safe to say there are several ship sinkings where you kind of it seems as if the ship is floating there in the last moments before it kind of before it goes down and uh, so that that very well could be the case here as well and at any rate once it lost its buoyancy completely it slowly dipped it into the ocean until it uh, disappeared and i suppose that's where uh, joffen comes back in and stepping off the stern supposedly and uh, not getting his hair wet which no way to verify that i mean he must have gotten his hair wet a little bit but he, uh, he we all we all know his story so yeah he when the when the wreck went under the water you know by the time the stern went under the bow was well somebody disappeared um it, when the bow kind of stabilized at a steep downward angle at about 30 miles per hour and it kind of got heavily damaged as uh hydro forces kind of ripped stuff off on the superstructure and uh yeah, yeah, the forward mast fell backward and broke its base. It probably hit the bridge or somewhere near there, and the bridge got kind of ripped apart. It was only made of wood, so it wasn't that hard to do. And through the broken aft end of the bow, just countless things came out of the ship. I mean, everything from just random pieces of furniture to the d deck candelabrum, that somehow made its way out of the bow at the end and uh, just so much so much junk and then the bow impacted the ocean floor it dug well into the mud it broke its back and you see that and on the wreck today if you ever see uh, like recreations of the wreck you'll see that the bow is severely bent under the well deck and other areas it's a massive and, wind. Yeah, and a, uh, a supposed down blast of water came and uh, just kind of did more damage generally. Uh, the middle sections that broke away from the stern, you know, they kind of fell all over the place. And uh, you know, the stern, as that went down, it just, whatever damage it took during the breakup, it just got, it got way worse. Like, so many pieces were ripped off of the stern the decks peeled back uh, more sections of deck broke away uh, the engine room probably got stripped clean of most of its uh, fittings the poop deck uh, broke away from the uh, from its from the frames and just kind of peeled back entire sections of the aft well deck broke off and just a complete disaster the stern by the time it reached the bottom and dug itself into the mud up to the propellers, it was just destroyed. And 
you know, the, to, it, it hit with it, it's to such an extent that like the hall itself just got splayed out with one side pretty much completely ripped off. It's kind of amazing how absolutely a mess the stern is. And yeah, once everything had settled, you know, some minutes after the two sections went underwater, it was effectively a, a crash site, like a plane and debris all over the place. And so you know, once this once this uh once the wreck was in its final form, you just you know, you had your bow and stern sections, you had huge sections of the decking around the third funnel and engine casing. You had sections of decking from D and C decks, like entire cross sections of deck just out there in the debris field. Piles of decks, um, hatch covers, sections of hull, engine cylinders, vents and fans. Just tiles upon tiles upon tiles and dishes and toilets and tubs and sinks. Coal everywhere. Uh, sections of plating and frames and beams. Uh, t the two double bottom pieces, the third funnel house, the the crew's uh, the officer's mess, the, the tangled davits, pieces of the funnels, just so much. Titanic was not only sunk, it was obliterated in some respects. And back on the surface, the people in the water... They were they were in water that was well below freezing at 28 degrees Fahrenheit or thereabouts, and you get rendered at that temperature helpless pretty much immediately by shock. You start to you can't think. You know, within minutes, you're unable to do much of anything except think about how cold it is, and even then, you might not be thinking very much. And you know, within an hour, most would be dead. And those are the lucky ones. Uh, yeah, within half an hour for most, probably. Once the ship was gone, of course, there were hundreds of people left in the water with no real chance of rescue. The lifeboats didn't come. You know, Some wanted to, but you know, people fought back on the idea. You know, they all thought that they'd get dragged under, that their boats would get swamped, that they'd all die if they went back. You know, a lot of fear between the people in the water and the idea of suction just kept them away. And over the course of the next half an hour to hour after the sinking, the screaming that was so loud in the beginning kind of it just died down gradually until it was silence. Uh, there were a few lucky people who managed to cling to wreckage um, or be only half submerged in the water or you know those who were clambering onto the Collapsible lifeboats, they, those few people managed to survive and get picked up by boats later. And, and Joffin, you know, he, he's not only lucky, he's, I honestly don't know about him. He's, a uh, he supposedly got drunk and that supposedly makes you, well, it does make you more susceptible to hypothermia. So how he survived is really a mystery. I think he wasn't in his in the water as long as he says he was for one thing, but yeah. Yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of cases of exaggeration, exaggeration you find in some of these things. The Titanic, indeed. So if we're, um, it's yeah, it's it's just past. I think two forty ish on Titanic. Titanic's time now. Uh, I have to, I had to do the math in my head to ch do the the change in time zones. Um, as Kyle just mentioned, being in the water for more than 15 minutes is uh, is life threatening. And for those who are still in the water, if they have not found refuge on a lifeboat or a large piece of floating debris, such as a, a, a door, and I'm not saying anything about Rose, I'm talking about passengers who, and crew who actually were able to find debris. Um, there's not much time left. And it's it's where some of the most depressing stories of the night come. And we're going to not go further into the details, the end details of Titanic's 
tragedy. Um, I don't think so. We should just focus on. We could be here forever talking about Titanic continuing. We could. I, I'm reading your notes, Kyle, and how it goes into the. It keeps going, which is amazing. It goes into the discovery of the, the wreck and pop culture and and everything, and it's great. Um, but I think we should finish up by um, both. We can give our opinions. Uh, if Ben's still here, I know Ben's still here in our chat. But we can all give our, our last um, little tidbits about what Titanic means to us after 110 years. I mean, we haven't, we haven't been around with Titanic for 110 years. But what Titanic means to us, perhaps, um, not to put us on the, the spot or anything. But because we probably, um, in our THG lives, and I'm not trying to speak for you, Kyle, but just speaking as a, a person who lives with Titanic every day and works with Titanic and even sells things about Titanic, my deck plans, um, you know, Titanic has become a part of my existence and every once in a while I, w I will forget that it was an actual event with real human life on board where uh, those lives were ended and each of each and every one of those 2,208 individuals had, a, you know, dreams and aspirations and a purpose. And that night was not necessarily one that any of them wished to remember. And yet here we are, um, mem either memorializing it or remembering it for one purpose or another. And we rem try to remember it because it's a fascinating and intriguing event for us, perhaps. But you know, for every, I, it's what one thing that's intriguing to me is to hear the reasons of other people why they love Titanic so much. Um, it's, it could be, you know, as, as something as simple as a, they love the, and are fascinated with the, the design of the ship, or if they just like, some people like the escapism of leaving the modern age behind and going back to the Gilded Age and that's fine. Or they just love the stories of um, everything. And, I just like to hear what people uh, think about Titanic now, and I'd like to ask you guys what you think of Titanic after 110 years, if you can. What Titanic means to you, maybe. Well, I click this button and see if I can view all super chats. If no one wants to respond, that's fine. You don't have to say anything about Titanic anymore. You've said a lot, and I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, I am. My voice is about to go away, but I'll I'll, I'll say that I've never I really like had a solid reason for why I've been so fascinated, but for by Titanic or what it means. I I think part of it is just another world, and it, it, it's it's this. It, it, it's the story and it's the setting and it's in a weird way it's almost this kind of I, I, I often say that I'm probably more into the technical side of Titanic than the historical side and that's fine like you've too. heard me like you've heard me talk a lot about some of the technical aspects and the kind of raw events and you know Matt for example, might talk more about the people and what's happening. Um, you know, I and that's it, always been kind of a weird thing with me. It, it's even when I was kind of a kid, Titanic was it was this weird mixture of the story, but also wow, I'm so fascinated by the ship itself. And it's it, it could be a neurodivergent thing, but it, it's very much just this kind of weird obsession with this old ocean liner and every aspect of it and it's it holds a lot of interest because of the, the, the how things were designed back then and, it, and this interest does extend to other ships of the time which is to, to a certain degree but none quite so much as titanic for some yes. reason it's something that titanic only has and i don't think I don't think there's one way. I don't think any of us can pinpoint what that is, and that's fine, you know. But I'd, I'd have to completely agree with everything that Carl was saying. It's 
um, just to add my two pence to what he was saying, it, it's something about this ship that brings us all together <clears throat> like this. I mean, I've had a fascination with the Titanic from about the age of about seven. And it, it was always seen as slightly morbid from other people, just this over overknown fascination with this ship for something that happened at that time just under 100 years ago and yet it's been part of my life now for a good oh, nearly 20 years not even that but still and it's it's still able to captivate and hold it i was even just watching the um animation again and for the those few moments of watching the final plunge it, it just sort of hit me afresh again that this is something that happened. This was real. People were on this ship. They were going to new lives. They were starting afresh. Some people were going just a vacation, and yet it was the perfect. It was the perfect storm. It was man saying that they've built an unsinkable ship. It was yeah. the events that led up to the iceberg. It was the iceberg coming out of nowhere and striking in the middle of the night. And it all just culminates into this gigantic bu bubbling pot of just a story that can be told over and over again. It never gets old. And there's always something new to be found. Like I said earlier as well, with, when the wreck was found, um, public interest was sparked anew. I wasn't around when the wreck was found, but just even when the films came out, when the books come out, and it's always just something new that, always just seems to drag people in with a story. There's the, the museums in America, in Belfast, they're always dragging people in. People always want to know more about this ship, and it just, it fascinates me in, in, in a way that it always seems to fascinate everyone else, that everyone brings their own viewpoint to Titanic. People learn from the Titanic, even though it was 110 years ago. People are still learning things anew and afresh just from one disaster, one mis not just one mistake, but a series of mistakes that happened over a century ago are still helping and shaping the world that we live in today. There was a quote, a uh, final thing from me, but um, in the um, Ulster Transport Museum, there's a quote on the wall, and I'm going to see if I can find who it was from very quickly. But it literally just said, um, the world woke... Oh, here we go, I've found oh it's jack I, I think it's jack there jack there mm -hmm. yeah the world the world of today woke up april 15th 1912 jack v there so yeah i think another thing is just the lessons that titanic has to learn and i think what lessons it teaches you are really going to depend on who you are and it's kind of what you pick up from the story um one that I've kind of come to recently-ish is we all know, as Ben said, there's always people, there's always new information about the story. And one of the, one of the big things with Titanic, we all know every, every year, every few years, there's new documentaries, shocking truth about Titanic, what really sank Titanic, new evidence, all these things. And people are, it's either old information that people want new or it's new information that people try to find and sometimes it's genuine and sometimes it's nonsense and uh, what it comes down to is people are always trying to find a lesson for Titanic what we can learn from it uh, whether that's hubris or, or or the dangers of I don't know cutting costs or something or uh or or dumb right. stuff like conspiracy theories and regardless of what it is you know, my take on the titanic story is essentially this you can do everything right and still fail and i mean that's I'm pretty sure it's like a lesson in star trek or something but titanic really is an illustration of that kind of thing in action People, you know, it, it didn't have weak steel. It didn't have weak rivets. It didn't, you know, the watertight bulkhead design. It was probably, I'm, I'm sure it was imperfect, but like it, it wasn't, it wasn't any real fault of the bulkhead design that it sank. It just it kind of got into the situation that nobody foresaw. Same with the lifeboats. They, 
there's there's a whole thing behind how they got to the lack of lifeboats that I'm sure we won't even get into here. That yeah, what it comes down to is they, you know, it's a combination of just you know a little bit of human error and a little a little lack of foresight and a little bit of a just a bunch of stuff. And it, it all all the it's just a whole bunch of factors that come together to form. A series of unfortunate events in a, in, a, in certain respects, and that's what brought Titanic down. It, it wasn't any one thing. It wasn't greed or hubris or anything like that. It, it it's just an ocean liner that got the bad end of uh, history, and it ended up sullying the memory of her class of liners, especially once uh, Britannic also sank. And I think it's, in that sense, I think it's also important to remember Olympic for the amazing career she had and her career as old and reliable. She did have like a, a fabulous career and this, she was a strong ship. We could, that's a whole other stream, but yeah, yeah there's yeah. a lot to be said about, um, Titanic, um, and we could go on about her, but um, I think we're going to, as it's nearing the 2 a.m., it's nearing the hour mark here, I think we're going to try to wrap it up. Um, I'm struggling mm -hmm. to find, thank you guys, sorry, for um, your answer to well, my question also, by the way. I'm, don't worry, Kyle, we're not going to totally wrap it up yet, but uh, I want to first say that uh, thank you to the other Super Chats that I do see here that I can read <laughs> to um, Simon to Jedi, to Monscar, as always, to um, Wimsterts Machine. Uh, appreciate your comments, too. Uh, they're, uh, yeah, I very much appreciate your comments. I, I don't know where to, f I'll be honest with you, I don't know where to actually access all the super chats um, to see them all in review without going back. Um, that's me having a moment of not understanding technology because I'm looking in my YouTube for all super chats, uh, but I still only see those four. So I am very sorry if you had a very specific question um, and gave a super chat. Um, if, if it was a question about the sinking or something, um, you know, uh, there's shoot us join our free discord you know where we talk about um lots of different subject matter um you can get that information on our website which i'll post right here boop -doop. and that will thank you anthony too for that too um we're trying our best on all sorts of things i think all of our voices are ending uh but I, like I said, I want to wrap it up soon, but Kyle wants to say something. But before I do, before Kyle gets to that, and before we say goodnight, there was a promised um, giveaway that was posted, <clears throat> and it was of an original book from 1912 that I that I have in my collection. I collect things for the sake of research, and then I don't need them anymore um, because I am don't want to be a hoarder and this is uh you can just google it to see what it is and it is a book from 1912 as i said called the sinking of Ti the titanic and great sea disasters thrilling stories of survivors with photographs and sketches and it is from as in it's it's um Who's who wrote this? Well, it's edited by Logan Marshall, author of *The Life of Theodore Roosevelt*, etc. So that's pretty good. Um, I had I have two of these in actuality, so I'm giving one away. This is the this is the more intact version. It's copyright 1912 by L. T. Myers. This is the more intact of my two. I have one that's a lot more damaged. But we're gonna give one away. Um, but we're going to ask a trivia question about Titanic, and the person in the chat who answers the question correctly first gets the answer. I gets the. I'm tired. Gets the book because it's 2 a.m. Uh, the Discord link. I don't have. I don't have it offhand. If someone can actually in our Discord give it to me, I can also post it in the chat. But I can say it's also here on our main website. You can find the Discord, I believe. 
Um, it's, it's, yeah, Ben, you should go to sleep too. Um, it's 7 a.m. where Ben is. He woke up at like five hours ago for this. But yes, without much further ado, I want to ask the question to you guys if you want to win the book, the, the, the free copy of this book from 1912, right after the sinking of the Titanic, this book came out. Um, I want to first give the answer to everybody in my Discord that I'm with, so that they can look for the they can look for the answer. So. And I'm going to paste them the answer. I believe that's correct. If you guys can confirm that first before I ask it, I will then ask the question. Kyle, you should know this. the answer to this. You're a te technical question. This is both a technical question and a... I'm, a, I'm a technical guy, but I'm not a numbers guy. OK, good. It's a, it's a it's a numbers question, so I think it's I think it's correct. So I believe it's correct. Ahead. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to find the first person in the chat who gets the um gets this question correct, um and they will get a free copy no matter where you are in the world. Uh, the sinking of the Titanic and great sea disasters, sterling stories of survivors with photographs and sketches. How many life jackets and life boobies were on Titanic? Life buoys, as in the round life preserver things. How many life jackets and life buoys? The first person to get both of those questions, both in one statement. Life buoys and life jackets total. Life buoys and life jackets. These are. This is a known figure, so I got to see. If you want this book, let me know. How many people awake are Titanic nerds? And how many people awake are just here for the heck of it, and that's to celebrate Titanic, and that's okay. Oh God, it went really fast. It went so fast it froze my chat. I I think I oh nope that's not right. Oh. Uh, I see one here. The I first see one, one too. You it's see. A... I see one that's really Hold close. On. Wait, I see one. I see one that's correct, I but I don't know if it's the first one. So I'm going to start scrolling up after that one. Wait, nope. I see one that's correct right here. This is... Uh... Oh, they're off by one. <laughs> oh, no, they're off 19, by... 12. They're <laughs> off by... No they're, no, they're off by more than one. Okay. Oh, they're off by all. Oh, someone. Okay, I see that some. I see some bit of information on Google is incorrect because I'm seeing the same numbers more than once. <laughs> I do see the correct answer, everybody. So, but I gotta see if this person is first. And it had, and it has to be in the same text answer because that's. Let's see. This is gonna be difficult. Okay, my chat just crashed, so um, I lost... Oh, no, I didn't. Yeah, my chat just crashed, so it's up to everybody else who's paying attention to find which was first. I've got... Uh, I've got... I put I put the one in our little chat here, the one no, that I, I saw. No, I, I saw one before that one. I, I saw oh. one... Be I saw... They... I saw somebody put the numbers, and that put through... I put two numbers without saying which was which before them. This is intriguing. Uh oh. The correct number was stated. It was 3,560 jackets and 49 life buoys. I have that in two sources, and they're not just Google, everybody. So it's not just Google. And if you want to see the sources, you can get the book. 882 and a half amazing answers to your questions about the Titanic. So yes, <laughs> that's where it's from. Yeah, I believe that person. Yeah, we can't play. So no, I'm pretty sure the person I put in the chat here is the first one. Okay, if that's who Kyle says it is, then 
I'm gonna wait, go... wait, hold on, hold on. Wait, hold on. Um, uh, hold I... on. I gotta double check something. Yeah, hmm. I think. I... Oh, well, there's someone who came before them. Yeah, yes. that's what I saw too. What Matt is saying. It's uh, it looks like. Yep, it's the one that uh, Matt says. Yep, that's, that's what who I thought. It is. So congratulations to uh, H7Pug. G Pub GM said it first. That's who we that three of us agree said said it first. So congratulations to H7 Pub GM. I tried to type it fast as I could as a nerd. Well, I'm glad you were a nerd and could type fast because usually I'm just a nerd and can't type fast. So yeah, that's it. It, it that information is in the book 882 and a half. And I did notice on Google, it is there, but it's not the first result. So I was like, this is going to be sneaky. So congratulations. I will give you this book. Enjoy the book, The Sinking of the Titanic and Great Sea Disasters, Thrilling Stories of Survivors with Photographs and Sketches from 1912. It's an original, I assume. <laughs> Just make sure uh, you get our, your contact info to us. We've uh, otherwise we can't send it. <laughs> yes, you can contact us at um, I believe just through our our I'm gonna say through our website. Oops, that's the answer. Through our there's a contact form on our website. I'm not gonna post our email address on our website right now, but there is a contact form on our website, and. We should be able to verify you that way, but yes. Um, because Matt, I think you just posted the link to Demo 401. Oh, it's Demo 401. We'll go get Demo 401 as well, but um, if you haven't yet. But we're, uh, I meant to do, well, that too, TitanicHD.com. Just, just remove the last part of it, and it's the same thing. But yeah, congratulations on the book. I'm I hope you enjoy it. It's it was fun to read. I uh, of the other copy I have of it, I took scans of the of all of the images in it. So um, it's a it's a fairly common uh, book um, in the Titanic community, but they're 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 valued and sought after uh, ones that are in great condition. So thanks everybody for being part of that little contest we had and little quiz. So yeah. So I just saw a question uh, that might dive into Kyle's last bit before we leave you guys on this anniversary slash update stream because we did have a little bit of an update on our alpha and demo progress. Someone asked if demo 401 is more updated than demo three, and it is. And Kyle, you asked me that you if you could talk a bit more about uh, yeah. alpha and demo stuff. Yeah, the demo 401 is considerably more updated than demo 3. <laughs> That's an understatement, in fact. Um, at, at the beginning of the stream, I went through a tour, of course, if you weren't here. Some of the uh, new areas that will be in the 1.5 update of demo 401. And we recently published a video t today uh, that shows those spaces. So yeah, go check that out. <clears throat> But there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, different things in Demo 401, especially once the 1.5 update comes out uh, that aren't just new areas. <clears throat> so something that I didn't get to earlier is uh, what kind of the, the game plan is, uh, such as it is at the moment, uh, in regards to Demo 401 and the Alpha. So in regards to 401, I'm still working on my part of the update. And, uh, yeah, there's still a couple of surprises that haven't been shown yet. And once that's done, uh, I'm doing modeling. That's going to go off to uh, our lead programmer and Unreal Engine uh, person and uh, tech director, Derek Revere. Uh, he's the genius uh, who is, he's, he's amazing with uh, working in Unreal Engine. And he's done the amazing stuff that you've seen in demo for a one so far and you know once my update goes to him he'll work on that 
I honestly don't know how long it'll be until the 1.5 update is done. I would say, I, I, I don't want to just throw out numbers, but if I had to give you a number, I would say no less than probably a month and a half, maybe more. Uh, all uh, the main thing I'll say is don't expect it today or anything like that. That's not that's not happening. Uh, it's gonna need a fair bit of work still once my part of the work is done. Once my part of the work is done, the alpha is uh going to take priority once again, at, at least on my front. Uh, as I said at the beginning of the stream, after the delay after delay with the alpha and the final kind of uh set of problems that we encountered with it the team kind of got dejected and uh, we needed I, I guess you could say we needed some time to sort ourselves out and uh, to do something that kind of made us that kind of uh filled us with a little i don't know how you would say it uh a sense of not purpose not, not, but hmm. something to Something to kind of get us going again, you know, after after the last almost year of, uh, you know, what had happened. And so we decided we would do a, a, a bit of a big update for Demo 401, and then I kind of snowballed that update quite a bit. And, yeah, so at any rate, once that's done, once I'm finished with it, I am going to start working on a blockout for Titanic. Uh, what this blockout is going to be is essentially the hull, the decks, including the interior decks, like the, the just the just the planes of the decks with sheer uh, frames, beams, uh, things like that. The the steel walls and stanchions and and whatnot. Not in super levels of detail but you know, blocked out in relatively simple models so that we know where everything on the ship is. This is something that we unfortunately didn't do at the start of the New Direction last year. It's something that uh, we determined it, it needs to be done uh, before we can really do much on the Alpha going forward. So uh, we're going to do that. I'll be working on the block out primarily. And once I start on that, you'll see, hopefully, quite a few updates in regards to it. But keep in mind, it's not going to be quite as impressive as some of the uh, 401 updates because it's going to be a lot of a block out. It's just going to be a block out, really, the ship. Uh, but that's a vital thing that needs to be done. And in that time, we'll also try to you know, get some other things done in, on the Alpha and try to fix up some of the models that we needed to fix uh, after we had went through the Alpha files. Uh, a couple of months ago, and then hope, and from there, you know, once the blockout is at least some ways along, we can jump back to the Folksol proper and uh, finally get that uh, first le release out. And uh, when exactly that'll happen, uh, we're not sure at the moment. Uh, but you know, as always, we'll try to keep you updated. But uh, it's definitely, obviously, it's been a bit of a slow news uh, thing lately. Uh, Matt, you got any, uh, anything? I have no news on that front. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I won't say happy that the anniversary is over, but I'm glad that now focus can shift again. Um, it's always an interesting time when, uh, April comes about, and now it's, it's time to... That shouldn't look that way. Sorry, I'm looking at the video file when I should be focusing. But yeah, it's time to uh, reverse engines again and shift from anniversary to alpha time. So, looking forward to that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's it for the... for my end of talking about alpha stuff. Uh, I'm ready to wrap this up a little bit because it's 2.15 a.m. my time and it's like three, gosh, I don't even know now, Titanic time because this watch I was using is definitely slow. <laughs> I believe it's um, a little after three in the morning um, where Titan Titanic and 
if you're just joining us right now, Titanic has sunk, everybody, uh, a while ago. Besides it being 110 years, it's 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 Titanic sank um, a while ago. So, anyone else? Ben, do you wish to um, say a, f a final piece as we say goodnight? Ben? Um, or good morning, I guess. Oh, Sorry. Well, yeah, it's good morning for me because it's quarter past seven in the morning in the UK. Um, well... I've, I've pretty much already said all I wanted you to did. say earlier. Um, thank you both for having me on um, for the stream. It's been um, really nice to come on and do a live stream, especially for the anniversary and uh, for the 110th as well. Um, yeah. It's been a I pleasure just having you. Hope, I just hope that um, it's been um, useful to some people and been a way to remember um, such a horrible event, but the, the um, positives that came out of it as well. And, um, yeah, I haven't got much more to say. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, I want to say thank you to everyone uh, who was here tonight, to uh, especially Kyle and Ben and Dave, but also the people behind the scenes who are uh, with us on our Discord, making sure that you know I'm audible, that I'm not stuttering too much, that Kyle was slowing down when he was going around giving the tour, that audio levels are fine, and that things in the chat are fine our moderators and everything uh shout out to everybody who was helping us um and a big giant titanic size thank you to not just all of you guys and gals and people who gave the super chats but for everybody who was here just watching us tonight remembering and thinking about titanic and those 2208 people who went through that event i think we had around I, I checked in. Somebody said 4,000 people on Discord. Um, and I was like, what? Really? I didn't expect that whatsoever. So, um, yeah. We peaked at 4,400. Neat. So that's pretty cool. Thanks, everybody, for um, watching it with us. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's always... This is the most important day of the year for us Titanic people. So um, it was special having you all here with us for our most special most specialist day in night um even though it is a tragedy you know i like to say that we're here to remember those 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 people so um that's what we're here doing um and i will leave because i'm tired and an introvert so i'm gonna wrap us up uh this recording will stay online if you missed it uh, anytime you can, I mean, you can go back, watch the animation if you dare, if you want to watch it, listen to any of us, uh, listen to me stutter, listen to Kyle and um, Ben and David give awesome um, tidbits and historical um, commentary. And you can also, uh, maybe I'll go back and try to figure out how to read all the stupid lost that I my dumb butt missed all the super chats during the stream, which I, uh, again, apologize for, but I'm say thank you so much um i if i swear that i thought that we could see them after the fact but i do not know know for the life of me how to get them um hi geo i see you in the chat there's our one of our main modelers on and researchers on the project right there hiding i don't know why he's not a I don't know why he's not a mod, uh, moderator, but yeah, there he is. <laughs> but um, he sent he's sending us good vibes, uh, and he's made most of, he's made some of the wonderful things you've seen. So yeah, I think we're going to definitely wrap it up now as it becomes 2:20 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's not when Titanic sank, but uh, H7. Uh, there should be a contact form on our page, in our on our website please check that out there um, and again guys um, it's been 110 years so it's just going forward um, remember that the unthinkable can happen so um, just keep that in mind when you go about your daily life and oh gosh I don't want to quote Titanic but uh, live your life to the fullest and don't take for granted anybody around you. Uh, I guess that's it. I'm going to stop rambling now. Everyone, uh, 
Make it count. You said it, not me. I didn't say it. <laughs> I didn't say it, but there was a point. Uh, a real man makes his own luck. So do I. <laughs> Ooh. All right, everyone. All right. I, uh, thanks to everyone who joined us and for supporting us and for yeah, yeah, yeah. And just I, I hope that you all have a wonderful morning, uh, afternoon, evening, night and uh, wherever else you are and thank you again for joining us thank you all so much and we will see you next time and i guess maybe we'll have to see you next year too all right take care bye bye that's not what i wanted to use the stream isn't starting soon the stream's ending